I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Sarah Lejnev. No. Okay. <laughs> Great. Did I get it right? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So the Olympic year was my high school like graduation oh, year. Almost, <laughs> while still in high school. National champ. Let's go, baby. Let's go. <laughs> well, that's kayaking first. Oh, that's that, not okay. rowing. Oh yeah, rowing is this way. I should not. <laughs> yeah. She does seem. I She does seem perfect. Yeah. Okay. I was like. I was like. Hello. Please speak slowly. I, I, I can tell you right now. I did not know what my left hand or right hand were doing. That's me at 15. Wow. Oh, so you're not a natural. <laughs> no. Because here I am, I'm about to hate him. <laughs> My guest today is brains, beauty, and a beast wrapped into one. She should have you reframing your mindset about what it is you can actually achieve in your life should you set your mind to it. Prepping for this interview, I left her a message. Damn girl, people like you make me feel like an underachiever. Now, please understand, I was not hating. I'm inspired. I'm truly inspired, which is why I'm super psyched that she's actually here on the show today. My guest leaves her family and home at the tender age of 15. She goes to France where she does her baccalaureate and graduates with honors. She's then recruited by the University of Florida, where she swims for Florida for four years. She graduates with a degree in political sciences and an undergrad certificate in international relations with the highest honors, summa cum laude. She then graduates with a master of business from the University of Wollongong in Dubai. And wait, she's not done yet. Because while we were messaging, she said she wants to do a doctorate. Only thing is at the moment she doesn't know what, but she plans on doing a doctorate once she figures out what she really wants to do. That's brains. Let's get into her being a beast. Sports seems to run through her veins. She's an Olympic swimmer, the first Tunisian female swimmer to qualify for the Olympics. She's a 2015 and 2019 master swimming world champion. In 2015, she wins one gold and three silvers. In 2019, she takes home four golds and one bronze. Wow. <laughs> Swimming is what she's done all her life. And then she thinks, you know what? I can do something else. So she decides to do rowing. And within two years, she becomes national champ in Tunisia and she becomes the national champ in the UAE. What? Whoa, wait, she's got more. Her next challenge, triathlon. Are you kidding me? Listen, I'm going to stop right now with the intro because if I was to keep going, it will take the whole entire interview. But let me tell you this, that this young lady has achieved so much, but she's going to achieve so much more. I just know it, the next decade, she's gonna do so much more because she's not the kind of person who wants to be defined by any one thing. She's the kind of person who continuously and consciously chooses to redefine herself. And I am so psyched that she's on the show today because I have so much to learn and I'm sure you will as well from her insights. This is How Do They Do It? I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Sarah Lejnev. Thank you for being here. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank I struggled with your intro. <laughs> but damn, I truly mean it. As soon as I read it, I was like, oh man, I am an underachiever. Not. How do you know <clears throat> that you're good at something? You don't know. You just try okay. and do your best, Okay. work hard, Yes. and then see what comes like, out of that. So you never know if you're good at something unless you try it. So you have to go that extra mile and try things and then you can tell. And you can tell yourself if you're good or not. When did you know you were good at swimming? Like how long did it take you to do swimming to realize, hey, I'm good at this? Like, not for someone else to tell you you're good at this, but for you to internally realize, hey, I'm good at this. Well, it didn't start by being good at it. Uh, it just started by loving it. Because, I mean, I started swimming when I was very young. Okay. And I started with my older brother. And funny enough, I hated doing anything except, like, jumping in the pool and doing, like, splashing water around, like, and, like, playing with my friends. So, and my mom used to yell at me all the time. I was so little and I didn't want to do anything else but, like, jumping and doing, like, starts. 
Um, but then I gravitated towards. To water. Yeah, and I and my my older brother was so good, and he kicked so well, and he was like amazing. But then he stopped. Like he didn't really like swimming. He started doing handball, and um, and I kept going, and I loved it. It mm. became part of my life. And then I started competing when I was eight or nine. But it's just like little competitions. It's not time competition. It's just like technique and. They just teach us how to like get into competitions and how to do like the starts and how to be in the competition mood, and I loved it. So. So it really, in this case, swimming just came about from you wanting to be in the water. Yeah, kind of, <laughs> and following my older brother pretty much. Yeah. Literally, the first couple of sentences you said made me think because we had this conversation before okay. the camera was rolling about you have to try and you're not going to be good at the beginning. You're going to be terrible. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump around with my questions, yeah. but while I have this thought in my head, you're an Olympic swimmer, we'll come to it, we'll go through the stuff that you've done and what you've achieved, but at some point you go, hey, I want to do rowing. Okay. And most people, perhaps including myself, my subconscious thought would be, of course, Sarah is an athlete. That's an easy cross. Swimming, rowing, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Did you literally turn up to rowing and go, National champ, let's go baby, let's go. <laughs> well, that's kayaking first. Oh, no, <laughs> that's no, not okay. rowing right? Oh yeah, rowing is this way. I should know, <laughs> I should know considering my brother used to row when he was a kid. So, no, it's not It's not automatic. Like, nothing is, like, we're not born knowing things, you know, like, you learn to do things. So, and I remember, like, the first time I showed up to the training, the coach had to take me because it was the military club and my parents are in the military so he couldn't say no but he looked at me and he was like how old are you in 2016 i was like 27 i was like 27 he's like what are you doing here you're a swimmer like why would you want to try something new i'm like i want to try it just try me like don't assume that i can't do it and uh yeah he took me to the water because he couldn't say no just because he couldn't <laughs> say no <laughs> And then uh, listen here. <laughs> always put yourself in situations where people can't say no. Exactly. Right? Whatever it is for you, just find so it. Sounds like you will not regret it. Like, please try me out. And he was like, You're you're old, like how are you gonna like learn how to row and you've never been on a boat? I'm like, I've never been on a boat, but I'm willing to be on one. You had never been? No. Okay. Never. Never. Like I probably like I never been on a boat or like I don't even know what it's called or like what are the oars or anything about like rowing and what you just woke up one day and you thought rowing well okay. that's how I'm gonna roll I'm gonna row one little things like I don't choose the sports just like this like yeah. I'm not going like from swimming to gymnastics it's not that it's first it's a water sport and then it's an endurance sport so with swimming I like I had endurance for like all the years that I've done swimming um, and then when I was little and we used to do like testing, um, they used to tell me that I could be good in rowing. So I was like, why not? Let me try it now that I have some time. And it was after the 2016 Olympics, um, like I had a couple of problems with my federation and I didn't qualify for the Olympics, for the Rio Olympics. So like another person would have stopped sports and would have been like so out of it that they would have just like the disappointment like, of not exactly. being able to make it yeah so but for me like okay i was not able to swim anymore but for me i wanted to try something different mm -hmm. and just like find myself in something else mm -hmm. and just like rebuild myself and just get back up so good stuff get inspired whether you're in dubai for business or pleasure the last thing you want to do is blow your budget on accommodation, which is why I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. Beyond being price sensitive, what I love about Rove Hotels is the fact that they are a combination of cafe, culture, and just coolness. Even my guests, many of them, when they arrive before we record or after we finish recording the podcast, they actually comment. They go, wow, this place is cool. The vibe is amazing. And it is amazing. So if you're in Dubai for business or pleasure, I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. So you turn up there, yeah. he's forced to take you. Exactly. <laughs> but clearly it was, he made it obvious that he didn't want to. Like <laughs> yeah, there was no two things about it. He did. And then and what then. happened? And then, uh, well, lucky or not lucky for me, my dad was there and he was taking videos of me the whole time and laughing at me. Um, and every time I get on the boat, I just like slip. Oh, so every you're not a natural. <laughs> no. Because here I am, I'm about to hate on you. Like, of course, she's a natural. 
I was. No, I was not. I was not because I didn't know. Like I didn't have rowing coordination. Like swimming is one thing, but rowing, like being on a boat, trying to keep your balance in the water and trying to move your arms and your legs in a different way than swimming is like it's pretty much impossible to your brain at first. But that's one thing about our bodies and our brain, like how strong and how like it's just like incredible what we can do when we put our heads into it. So the body just follows the head. And I just started little by little, like instead of falling every time I got in a boat, I was falling every like 10 seconds or like every 30 seconds. And then I was able to do one stroke and then like flip again. So it was so funny. But um, after a month, I was national champion in Tunisia. Wow. So, and my coach, that coach was jumping on the rock <laughs> next to me, like we were on a double. So, and it was coastal rowing. So it's like even harder because you row not on flat water, but you row in the waves. You went so, from a non-believer to a believer. Well, when, exactly. you, when you're a national champion. You <laughs> one person at a time. That's like one of my, like one of my mottos is like one person at a time. If I get to convince or like inspire or just talk to one person and they believe in themselves, it's, it's enough for me. So if I get to have like two, three, Man. ten, it's even more amazing. I'm inspired, seriously, <laughs> because take me through your thought process, because this, this is important. When we want to do something new, mm -hmm. very often we don't try yeah. because we're going out of our comfort zone. Yeah. So many in their lives, including myself, I've yeah. had many situations where when I look back and if I want to actually critique myself, the reality is I haven't tried because it would require me to go out of my comfort zone. And we naturally as human beings, we don't want to go out of our comfort That's zone. Fair. And then if we want to go out of our comfort zone, mm -hmm. And we're faced with a challenge where I'm literally, say for example, if it was me, I can just imagine if I'm sitting there in the rowing boat, correct <laughs> now, and I flip a few times, uh -huh. perhaps my thought would be, maybe this isn't for you, Kev. Yeah. What was going through your mind? Well, for me, it was not that. Like, for me, I would flip and then go back, like swim to the shore and then go back on the boat and be like, no, you can do it. Like, you will do better next time. Like, it can't be worse than that. Like, once you flip, it won't be worse than that. Because, like, in rowing or, like, those, like, sports, once, it's like, for, like, we'll talk about it later in triathlon, like, if you don't, like, fall from the bike, you will still, like, have that fear of falling off the bike. So once you fall, you're good to go. So you, you will be, like, you will have, like, something that just got released and you will do better. So in rowing, it was the same thing. For me, falling, was just the start. So once I just like I was falling and like kept falling in the water, I was comfortable with falling in the water. So that's your worst case scenario. Exactly. So I was comfortable actually falling in the water. So then I was like trying to manage how not to fall and like I was more comfortable like managing the boat. So like trying to move right and left and not like fall, move the oar. So and it worked. And then I started going like and I mean we can learn like once we put our heads into something like our minds are very strong so we just have to give them the chance to be strong not just sell ourselves short and then be like oh i can't do it because it's easy to say i can't do it but you have to try and then it's fine to fail like failing is part of it but not trying you already like killed whatever you could have done even before it started well said so, yes yes yeah. well said do you still run um, well, I still row indoors, so I row on the rowing machine, but because of, like, my club is far now, okay. that I live in Jumeirah and my club is in, like, almost the wind, so it's, like, very far for me to right. get there, but if I had the chance to row in Dubai, I would. So how do you choose it? Because we'll go to the swimming, but you, you did swimming, mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, all your life so far, mm -hmm. and then you decided, okay, I'm going to do rowing. Was that with a target in mind, or was it to handle a disappointment because we want to, I want yeah. to get into that mm -hmm. of let me get my mind yeah. off it and yeah. do something else. Mm -hmm. Which one was it? Well, it was both. So for me, it was trying to get back on my feet and trying to forget about that disappointment and um, working towards another goal, let's say. But at first, I mean, I was not planning to win national championships or to come back to the UAE and win like the seven, like um, the seven whatever it is, wait, is it, mm, we have rounds, have okay. rounds. Yeah. so I'll say it again, um, so yeah, I mean, what, what was the question? 
So, so my, my question, I guess, yeah. is when you like you qualified for the Olympics mm -hmm. in 2012, mm -hmm. and I'd like to get into that and get yeah. your mindset and what mm -hmm. you were thinking and so yeah. forth and how it felt. Yeah. But in 2016, when you didn't qualify for the Olympics, this is a hard blow. It is. In life, we face rejections. We yeah. face this would be perhaps yeah. as an athlete, mm -hmm. you're working so hard to qualify, and you get to a point yeah. where you're, boom, exactly, it hits you in the face. And it's kind of was not my fault, so it made it even worse. Okay, so, so yeah. in that case, then it becomes career-ending move for many. Yeah, exactly. Some go into depression, some just move around, mm -hmm. and others just, I suppose, just end up stopping sport yeah. altogether. True. What were you thinking? For me, I love sports, and like. From my position, I was not ready to give up on sport just because I had that like low point. Mm. So yes, I was fed up with swimming at that point, um, and I actually I couldn't swim anymore. Like I like mentally, I had like something blocking me from swimming. So um, and I loved sports, so I told myself what to do better. Like so, I was like, let me try something else. Let me try something different. Um, let's go and try rowing. So rowing was the sport that actually saved me from whatever was going to happen to me, like the depression, as you said, stopping like every sport in general. Um, but going into rowing, I mean, I was not planning to be a national champion or to come back to the UAE and win like across the board the seven rounds of the championship and be like national champion at the end. Um, like I started rowing because I wanted to do the sport and continue in the sport and I was not ready to go back to swimming. So um, it was a learning experience for me. It was a way to come back and a way to get back on my feet. Um, and when I started learning it, I kind of like got into loving it and liking it and wanting to do better and challenging myself and then putting like challenges because I mean, and I, know, I knew from the first day I got into rowing, the coach told me, okay, the, one of the reasons he said, no, you cannot do it because the championship was a month after. And he was like, what are you coming to do? Like the championship is a month. I was like, I will participate in that championship and you will see, like we will win. So I'm kind of like, I'm a fighter by nature. Wow. So you really put it out there. Yeah. And I kind of like, I couldn't, because when I put a target, you know, like anyone, when we put a target and when we announce it, like you cannot back up anymore. Like you cannot go back and say, oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, I'm just taking my words back. No, you can't. And you thought I'm going to announce this. Exactly. And by announcing it, I'm I kind committed. of like exactly. I'm committed. I'm pushing myself. Like I was there every single day. Like I was the pretty much like the only person committed to that club and coming every single day, like day in and day out, like weekends, morning and afternoon. Like I was doubling some days. So, so you had this vision to compete in a month. Yeah. While you were, while you were falling off. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's respect right there. <laughs> yeah, and believe me, the day I went on the boat because. It's a double, it's not even like a single, so you're with another person on the boat. So the fate of the boat doesn't depend only on you. Like, it's not only you, it's like a relay in swimming. Like, your team depends on you. So for me, it was a double. So the other girl, like, if I do something wrong, it's both of us. It's like, I'm not only screwing myself, I'm screwing both of us. So I had to work extra hard to just like, have her to believe in me and get on the boat with me. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, she was the best girl in the team at that point. And like, in order to, to get on the boat with her, it was kind of like a privilege. So for me, I had to win that privilege. And um, yeah. And you went all out. And yeah, I did. <laughs> and based on what you're saying, what was, what would you say was the difference that helped you get there in a month when others may have been rowing for a couple of years, if not mm -hmm. more? What would you say? Were there disciplines or habits that you had yeah. that separated you? Or was it God's gift and natural talent? No, it's like, you know, because that's the easiest excuse for me. Exactly. The talent, like the talent doesn't get you where you want to be. Like it's it, it makes you start, but it doesn't get you where you want to be. It was like, I told you it was hard work. Like I was training morning and afternoon. Like I was getting there at 6 a.m. in the morning before even the coach gets there. And I was waiting. I would wait for him in the morning and then go get lunch and come back. So I was decided to get into that championship, not only get there, but win that championship. So I had to do everything I could to get to that point. So, um, but it was consistency too. Like some people just show up on a day and then they don't come back and then, or they only come on the weekends because they're, they're having like kind of multitude of like excuses. 
So for me, no, it was like no excuses. I couldn't give myself any excuse to not train. So. Um, and yeah. run me through, what did it take, just so we understand that it wasn't a walk in the park? Because to me it sounds like a walk in the park, no it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't, but you were there before your coach, so yeah. take us through the days like leading up to that month. So like, I, I want to know, how yeah, does someone sure. go from falling off <laughs> this vessel? You know, I sent you a picture, right? Of the my, of, my uh, of the video falling yeah. off and then of my, like how my The blisters, hands were. that's yeah, right. Yeah. The blisters and the blood. Yes. So I was bleeding on the day of the competition, like the month, one month later, I was bleeding and my hands were wrapped and I was like hurting so bad that I like, I could barely like hold the oar and like turn it, but I had to do it. So what was your routine? So it was getting there at 6 a.m. in the morning. Before the coach. Before the coach, yeah. Man, this is amazing. Before the coach, she would <laughs> Yeah, up. before the coach. So I would run. It depends like if like it depends on the training, but I would run before and then I would get on the rowing machine. Kev, what are you doing at 6 in the morning? I'm <laughs> snoring, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, so you you should get on, on like a training <laughs> yeah. routine. <laughs> you need to get on. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So yeah, so I would run and then either do a gym session and then get on the boat and do like some technical stuff or row on the rowing machine. Like the run is always there and then row on the rowing machine and get on the boat and do like longer distances. Well, well when I was able to do longer distances, I started doing longer distances and then like leave. Like I couldn't go home because the club was far from home. So I would just like have lunch and then come back wait a little bit and then in the afternoon we start the session again so it's either like i mean doing some stretching some like warm up outside rowing on the rowing machine on outside of the water and then getting the boat and doing again like another boat session in the water so yeah how many hours would you sleep oh i well i would sleep at like 10 to be able to wake up at 5 and show up at the club at like 6 so, you needed to so get good, i needed six, to get good sleep to... because the whole day i'm training so and i needed to get good nutrition so it's, it's like it's not only training it's everything around it so um that's that's like how athletes live it's like it's a whole life that you're actually you're living in a different planet very mm. much so it's not only training because training doesn't get you to where you want sure. if you're not doing everything else if, if you're, you're not, not recovering resting. if you're not eating well if you're not like if you're not mentally ready to actually perform at every single training you can't get to where you want to be get inspired one of the questions that i get frequently asked is kev how can I increase my motivation? We see great individuals, we see achievers, like many of the guests that I'm bringing on the show. They have the energy, they do so much, they're in a state of flow. How do they do it? Well, my team and I have released an article which I've made available on kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog, the ultimate biohacking guide to increasing motivation. Or you can simply Google Kevin increase motivation and the article should pop up right at the top. It's absolutely free. Read it, and most important of all, take the bits and pieces that are relevant to you and apply it into your life to increase your motivation. I hope you find the article of value. If you do, feel free to leave your comments and also share it with your circle of friends. Again, you can Google it, Kevin Increase Motivation. It will be the first link that pops up or on my website, kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog. What would you do to stay in that mental aspect? Because often, you know, 60, 70% of the mm -hmm. time, our natural thought gravitates to a negative thought. Yeah. And then if you're surrounded by negativity, that's even worse and yeah. da, da 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 I mean, we now live in an era where yeah. this is known. <laughs> what would you do? How do you protect your mind? Or how I, do you... Well, I try to be positive. Um, I try to surround myself with positive people, not like my coach. <laughs> or if the person is negative, I try to get them on the other side and make them like try to think positive but throughout this whole thing like when i'm thinking about it if you wake up in the morning having a target having a goal okay is actually what makes you wake up every morning and you, because not having a goal you can't really keep that consistency and that commitment to whatever you're doing because you don't have a goal you're not working towards something but actually having a goal is one of the secrets of like consistency and training day like every single day even in weekends and not having like that like when your alarm like goes in the morning you'll be like oh no i'm not feeling like it this morning mm -hmm. i mean we get that but then you remember like in like two seconds time you remember that you actually have a target and you need and what are you like, saying to yourself 
you just say, just get up. Like, I mean, I had that this morning. Like, it's a this simple morning, attack. believe me, <laughs> this morning I had that. Like, I was so tired because I had a swim session yesterday and I just, like, I was really tired and I went to bed a little bit later. So, and I was supposed to cycle this morning and I was like, like I put my alarm, like I put three alarms. When I know that I'm tired, I put like three different alarms. So, and my last alarm went off and I was like, oh, I don't, I really don't feel like going. But then I was like, come on, you have a target. And if you don't manage to get up now and do it, you will feel awful after that. Like, okay, you're gonna sleep like two extra hours yes. and then wake up and be like, oh, I didn't do it. So good job, yes. good for you. You didn't do the session, so, and then I will feel awful. So. But after I finished my cycling session this morning, I was I felt amazing. I felt satisfied. I felt accomplished because I didn't give up and I didn't like give any chance to that thing in my head that saying no sleeping. So sleeping in like you can sleep anytime. Like I could go back and sleep. So but you just have to set your priorities and set your goals straight to know what you're working towards. Have you always been this way? Like, have you always been so self-aware that I need to have a target that's important? Because it's easy to look back. Yeah. Uh, you're only 30, <laughs> but it's easy to look back because you've achieved so much. It's easy to look back and go, okay, these were the things. Because I had a goal, yeah. my self-talk was get up. Yeah. And it's as simple as that, get up. Yeah. Like, you have a target, get up. I think I've been like that since I'm very young. Okay, was yeah. this an influence that came from parents? But um, I know you're quite close to I your think, family. I think so. I am very close to my family. Um, is that something you learned from them? Or was yes. that an experience you had yes. somewhere else? Uh, I mean, I did. I really am very grateful to my family because of everything that I learned from them. And seeing my parents, like, every day when I was young, like, both my parents are in the military. My dad is retired, but my mom is still, like, in service. So, uh, but I see how my mom fights in a men's world. And she's, like, an officer. And she was doing everything, like all the hard things that a woman, like, supposedly cannot do, she was doing. So for me, she was the person that I looked up to and I wanted to be like, even if it's like on a different field, but I wanted to be like my mom. I wanted to be that, like, badass woman that just, like, everyone looks up to and be like, wow. Like, because I remember when I, like, when we had the meetings with the parents and, like, the teachers, like, when my mom used to come with the military uniform. Like when I was younger, I didn't like it because I would like, mom, why are you embarrassing me? Like you're coming with your military yes. like uniform. And it was like, for me, I didn't understand what was that because I felt like it was not a woman-like thing. But then when I grew up a little bit, I was so proud of it. And then my teacher started telling me, wow, your mom is like in the military and she's an officer and she's this and she's that. And I was so proud of it. And and then I was like, wow, my mom is something like, and I wanted to be like her. So, um, but I left when I was very young too. So for my mom, I was still that baby that left her when she was 15. So, um, and I learned like whatever I got in those 15 years from her and my dad, I just like try to keep it with me and teach myself how to be disciplined just even when I was on my own. I mean, I lived on my own when I was 15. I, I rented, like, they rented me like a, an apartment and I was waking up at 5 a.m. in the morning and crossing like a dark place to get to training when I was in France. So, I mean, it's, it, it was not easy. How do you, I was going to ask you, how did you deal at 15? I mean, I can imagine now, yeah. at you know, 38 <laughs> being uprooted, to go somewhere, I, you know, it's yeah. away from my family, uh -huh. or away from a loved one, or away from a friend, or yeah. away from anything. What kind of feelings or emotions do you feel at 15? Yeah, you're still a kid. I was, I was really a kid, and because even when when I was with my parents and when we were in Tunisia, we were so like together with my two brothers, like. We used to like not go anywhere, like from home to like school and then training and then go back home in a car. Like we don't go anywhere. Like we didn't have like because we were training and we were training late. Like the swimming routine was hard. That we didn't have like a lot of social life. So um, so when I moved to France and I was on my own, then I had to like count on myself. Yeah. So it was not easy. And I remember my dad took me because my mom was like. It's out of question that I'm taking her and leaving her there and coming back without. So my dad took me. 
And I remember it was raining that day, and my dad had like tears in his eyes, and he didn't want to show me because and I was like, Dad, what's wrong with you? And he was like, No, 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 it's just raining outside, and I'm fine. And then I didn't even hug him, like because at that point I realized that my dad is leaving me. He's going, and I'm not going with him, and he's going back home, and I'm staying. And I had class that day, so I just told him, Bye, Dad. Bye bye, and I went straight into the class. So that was my way of dealing with that separation. Mm -hmm. But then it was really hard. Like the whole like three months, probably the first three months, I was crying. But I was not crying with my mom. I was crying on my own. But when I called them, I was like trying to be strong and show them that I'm strong and I'm fine and I'm okay. So like my mom doesn't just smell and like make me feel even worse. Yeah. So I was trying to be strong in front of them, but I was like really struggling and homesick. Like outside and like when I'm on my own so could you not give up and just come back no it was out of question it was out of question because it was like my parents it was me it was the federation it was my country it was like a lot of things involved it was not only me it, it, it was like com like completely out of question to just like let everything go and was this a decision you were willing to make and accept like in terms of a target because this was for swimming right yeah was this something you decided at 15? Was it made for you or you decided like, no, no, I've got too many people counting on me and... I decided actually because um, when this opportunity came... Uh, I, don't, 15. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you right now, I did not know what my left hand or right hand were doing. That's me at 15. Wow. Yeah, I, it's just like when the opportunity came and the Federation asked my parents and they were like, do you want to send her to France? Um, they came to me and they asked me and I was like, okay, yeah, I want to go. I want to try this and I want to be better at swimming and I want to try this experience. Like, and I'm so happy that I took that decision and I'm grateful to my parents to have like given me that like to make that decision and gave me the opportunity to choose for myself. Yes. So they were not like you go or you don't go. Like, I mean, and Tunisia is quite like, we're quite conservative too. So, and we're like in a Muslim, um, like community and things so it's not easy for parents to just let go of a girl too I wasn't even like a guy but to let go of their daughter like their only daughter and just let her go on her own and like hope for the best yeah so and I'm very grateful to my parents to like that because they gave me that opportunity and they I allowed would, you to make exactly, a choice exactly so and what's interesting though is the easier choice would have been to stay in your comfort zone yeah especially you're in a tight-knit family yeah you're and I was doing good. Yeah. I, mean, I was doing great in swimming. I was the best, and I could have stayed the best. But it's just like staying with my family, like just doing what I do best and what I know how to do. So you were just being like a big fish in a small pond. So. so kind of like because I got to a point where I was like the best in swimming, and that's when the federation were like, okay, you want to get better? You we need to send you outside of the country to like swim with like better people and that was so, that was a driving force yeah to yeah. push you out of your comfort zone yes i mean i like trying new things and i like pushing myself like i mean i kind of like learned that about myself the hard way but um that's your I, trigger yeah i i don't like being ordinary like ordinary doesn't doesn't cut it for me so i always like to go the extra mile and do something different and do things differently so and I think I like it I mean that's how I roll that's that's my way of life yeah so yeah how you roll is <laughs> how you roll right um, in terms of swimming mm -hmm. you <clears throat> you make it to the 2012 yes. uh, Olympics you qualify as the first Tunisian female mm -hmm. swimmer yes yeah but I mean it took a lot before that so. how long did it like what did it take it's easy to say, mm -hmm. well, technically it wasn't easy to say, yeah. I had to pack this <laughs> sentence right. Um, how, long, how much work goes into you becoming an Olympian? It takes a lot. It takes a lot of work. Like time being, frame? Time frame, I mean, the Olympic cycle is four years, Correct. but it takes more than four years to like get to the Olympics. Like some people take 12 years. Like they start preparing kids from like a young age to get to the Olympics, like after 12 years. So that's like eight to 12 is actually the time frame um, wow. to, to get to the Olympics. So I left home in 2004 and I qualified in 2012, which were like eight years. Um, but it took a lot of hard work before that and changing places and changing coaches and changing training routines. 
to like finally get to where I want it to be. So um, this is yeah. in essence kind of like entrepreneurship, or yeah. it's like business yeah. because you have an idea mm -hmm. and you want to execute on that idea, yeah. and then your results and your growth happens by yeah. you having to adjust and make exactly. changes on a continuous basis. Yeah. How did you know when you needed to make the changes? So it's now clear effort uh -huh. at one hundred and ten percent from yeah. your end. You wake up early, you mm. finish late. You're yeah. willing to put in the effort. Yeah. But we know, and including myself, and perhaps yourself, maybe you've experienced this, where you're putting in all the effort you can, Impossible. and after some time, you're just hitting a dead, you know, yeah. the wall. And yeah. it's to know when you should either quit yeah. or pivot. Exactly. Because that's a wall. Yeah. We need to make changes until we find a door. Exactly. So. Can you take me through in this eight year journey, which is really long. It's so easy to say eight years. Yeah, eight years long. is a long yeah. time. And being a 15 year old in a foreign country, being a 15 year old girl in a foreign country that like, I mean, it was a different language too. I mean, French is our second language, not our first language. And, and you speak amazing English and it's your third you. language. Thank you. <laughs> Let me highlight this. It's her third language. Thanks. But believe me, when I got to the US, the first day, it was a struggle. I mean, the first day when my roommate came to talk to me, I was like, I was <laughs> like, hello, please speak slowly. And then, I mean, it took me a while to get comfortable in English. I, I remember the first exam that I had, I had a translator with me and the, the teachers allowed me to have a translator with me. But to go back to like the friend, like the French and the, the travel to France, um, well, yeah, I was 15 and... And, um, and the thing was, you've got eight years of yeah. prep and because you said you changed coaches and mm -hmm. you changed things and yeah. you need to adjust, when did you know when you needed to make the changes? Like when did, what were the things that made you think, okay, I need more effort mm -hmm. okay, or it's not effort that I need to yeah. do, we need to make changes. Well, you know it, it's kind of like, well, first it's by experience. Um, and then when you don't feel comfortable in what you're doing, like you know that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. So you need to look at what you're doing and assess. So you keep the things that work and you kind of try to change the things that don't work. It's like, as you said, in the business framework or like you have to actually look whatever you're doing and kind of assess every six months, every one year, every like, you have a time frame to for assessment and then see what's working and whatever is not working. For me, what didn't work, like my I stayed for two years in like um, the east of France and then it didn't work for me that well because in Tunisia I was kind of like the star. So when I went to France, I was training with older people, very old people, like way older than me. So they were in like the French national team and they were in the A team. So they were not like the squad, like let's say the juniors. So I was training with the A team. And for me, it didn't work because the coach was focusing on them and less on me. And I was just like following. Mm -hmm. So that point for me, at that, at that moment, it did not work for me. And I was not doing my best times. So I decided to change. I decided end of 2006, I decided to change, like going into the new school year. And you I would a coach that would focus on you. Yes. And believe me, I was what, like, I was 17 or like 16, not even 17, and I took that decision and I had to look up clubs and schools in other areas of France that will match what I wanted. You did that? I did, yeah. I did that wow. and actually I was in conflict with my mom because my mom didn't believe that something was wrong with my team. She was like, something is wrong with you. Yes, I mean, that's the... Yeah. That's a natural kind mm -hmm. of thought process. Exactly. So so I had to deal with that. Like I had to deal with my mom and convince her to let me move from one place to another. And I actually didn't choose the easy way. I moved from the east to the complete west to like Brittany. So um, slightly different. Yeah, completely different. <laughs> Going from like the German way of doing things to like the kind of like the British way. So um, but I moved and I took my stuff. I took my bag and I crossed France um, by the train and I got there. The coach was waiting for me. He was like, welcome, hi, hello. And I uh, got to know the coach. Like, I, it was the first time I met that coach because everything before that was just like phone conversation. Um, and the coach was very excited to get me because he looked at my CV and my background and my time and he was like really excited to get me on the team. And that was a good move. And it was a great move. So that's when I actually qualified uh, for my first World Championships in Manchester. Uh, that's when I did uh, French 
junior national champion. And that's when uh, 2012, I missed like the, the Olympic qualification by like hundreds of a second. Wow. Ooh. Yeah, that's yeah. Painful. It was very painful. Um, but it was it was all a learning experience for me. But I did like my best times and I was like doing great. So, um, and that's when I graduated from high school. So the Olympic year was, was my high school like graduation oh, year. Oh, 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 <laughs> still in high school. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And then decide like my coach unfortunately the the good story didn't like finish well because my coach uh, got fired from the club uh, just because he took decisions in favor of the swimmers and not in favor of the club but that was bad for me because I had to move from club mm -hmm. so he recommended another team for me and I decided to take a year off after like high school uh, just to like set like think straight and then decide where to go like either staying on friend like staying in France or like moving to the US or doing something so I took a year off, but I was training still. And that year went well, that, that year also went very good because the team that I was training with, we were only like two elite swimmers. And then uh, the, like, the, the junior team with us. So the coach, like the focus of the coach was really on us. Mm -hmm. And he was a brushstroke, like, which I am too. So the coach was a brushstroke coach and uh, my uh, teammate was a brushstroker too. So it was very good for me. I qualified for um, for Rome, uh, my first long course world championships, I qualified for the Mediterranean Games in 2009, and I got like recruited by the University of Florida. So, um, so it was it was good. And then I moved to the US. <laughs> she just makes it sound like it's a walk in the park. <laughs> it's you know like when I talk about it, I feel like it is a lot actually, but I don't it realize is. it unless I talk about it. Yeah. Because sometimes I just be like I like between me and myself, I'd be like, what? Like in these thirty years of you know, your I, life, <laughs> I, I did an interview with a um, with one of my friends. He's okay. a, quite a, a known comedian around the world. His okay. name is Nitin Murani. Okay. And he actually uh, mentioned this point where he said that every now and again, one of his recommendations yeah. um, for the listeners, viewers, and everyone really is something he does. And I'm going to start to do it. Is he goes? Most of us are looking now and forward. Yeah. He takes the time to actually just look, look back. back. Something yeah. he learned from his wife. Mm -hmm where she told him, hey, look at all the things you've exactly. been through. Yeah. Right? And appreciate, hey, you've gone through X, Y, Z challenges, yeah, and imagine all the things that you've done. Yeah, So, and only when you actually look at it or talk about it that you realize that it's actually, you did, you, you did quite great, like, yeah. yeah, in whatever you've done, so. You've done yeah, a lot. Definitely. And what about energy levels? Because I can see people who do a tenth of mm -hmm. what you're doing, Yeah myself and just hearing you speak i'm out of energy whoa like i want to I get an apple oh i wanted you to be the opposite i kind of no, like usually i give energy to people no 100 but i'm thinking wow like how do you get that kind of energy to sustain yeah to I, sustain what i you get doing. my energy from the water yeah, no, sure. actually i do but out of interest like what's 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 been like your nutrition thing so if you look back have you has it obviously it's evolved, yeah. but has it been mainly a certain way of eating or mm, consumption? No, not really, because swimmers we uh, eat we whatever eat, we eat a lot, yeah. Uh, because I mean we burn a lot, yeah. So, uh, but no, it's never been. I mean, I went through like phases of like gaining weight and then losing weight and then like things, but like now I'm very stable and I know what I'm eating. So I mean, I mostly eat healthy. Mm -hmm. I just like I do like the the eighty twenty. Thing. So 80% uh, is healthy food and then sometimes I indulge myself just eating like a burger once a week or once or two weeks just to like have that like nice thing but then I feel horrible after I eat it anyway so but thank god I don't like crave it all the time yeah. so but I have a sweet tooth so I have to control that uh, that's my only problem actually is, how do you control yeah. it? I just don't buy sweets because <laughs> if I have sweets at home I will eat them yes but if I don't have them I'm fine when I go out, sometimes I crave an ice cream, sometimes I crave like a brownie or something. So, um, but I don't buy them. Like I don't get them home. I got, I don't get these things. You home. know yourself well enough exactly. to go. Out, okay, yeah. let me create the environment. Exactly. You know, yeah. so much is in our control. Yeah. I had a friend of mine. I remember a few years ago we were at his place to watch the football. I think one of the World <laughs> Cups was on. This is yeah. I don't know. I can't remember which year it was. And he had a bowl in his living room. Of all, like the Snickers, the oh Bounties. Oh my God! <laughs> I walked it into heaven. I was like, uh, 
uh, hello. You What's your care. name? And uh, <laughs> it was a whole lot. Like, you know, there was, I think, maybe 15 or 20 of us. And my first question to him was like, how long has this been sitting here for? Oh, God. He goes, oh, I've had this ever since I moved into the apartment. <laughs> what? He goes, yeah, for me, this is my way of discipline, which was interesting because we were so mm, completely yeah. different on yeah. this approach. And I'm about to tell you why. He had this bowl of chocolate mm -hmm. that had been sitting there for months, I think, yeah. since he had actually moved in. Mm -hmm. And for him, it was the discipline of knowing that it's there, but, you but he's not it. going to yeah. do it. And that was his wow. self-talk with himself. Yeah. Well, I was clear about my self-talk. That's self -talk. kind of torture, though. That's what I thought. <laughs> I, I thought I'd be a good friend. So that evening, that whole bowl was anything. gone. <laughs> I handled it. I did. I handled the business. Good. Yeah. And I'm very clear that I had the same problem as yours. Yeah. But I can't use that as an excuse, continuously go and buy chocolate, yeah. put it at home. Yeah. So for me, it's I avoid it. Exactly. If I taste sweet, I yeah. want the whole thing. Okay. And, yeah. okay, I can't change that behavior, yeah. but what I can do mm -hmm. is not have it. True, but you can't, like, drive yourself from it, like, for a long time, because then you will crave it. Yeah, I don't feel yeah. deprived. For me, yeah. it's, it's a choice, but I understand that, okay, if I start on something, then yeah. I want the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. I don't feel like I need to start it. Okay, well. That's good. Yeah. That's very good. And it's interesting, yeah, because we're different. We gotta see what works. True. And so yeah. for you, it's definitely. But for me, life. I have a weird sweet tooth, though. Like I don't crave chocolate or like those things. That's I fine like. With you. We can't be friends anymore. <laughs> no, I like chocolate, but I like dark chocolate, and I like mm -hmm. like bitter uh, desserts, and I like lemony desserts, That's and something. you know, like I don't like sugary things. Oh yeah. So sugary desserts. Not my thing. My brother just had his birthday and we should oh. have you a slice of a cake. Oh. Because his wife just made this awesome lemon cake and it's all healthy. Oh my god. Sorry. That, the next one that, I'll, I'll save you a slice. <laughs> that sounds great. I'll save you a slice. So yeah. You you seem perfect. No, I'm yeah. not. <laughs> so yeah, so, 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 so most people. Okay, sure. Like, oh, we can talk so about perfect. that. Yeah. yeah. She does seem yeah. she does seem perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please, you, tell, you me how, touch on please that? tell me how you are not perfect because it will make me feel really much better. <laughs> Well, <laughs> this yes. is like a very this uncomfortable is question. <laughs> this is real talk. Well, I'm not perfect because I mean, but that's like a general thing, not a general thing. But you can most take this in whatever direction you want. Are like bad at relationships. Okay. Because we put our sports in a, like at first, like yes. and like it's top of the list. So we don't know how to manage our relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, because if we don't like, okay, it's either you date as an athlete, like you be with an athlete, and then you both train, like it's it's great, you both see each other, but then you get competitive, and sometimes it's like a recipe for a disaster. Right. And if you don't date a, an athlete that doesn't understand what you're doing, he will be like, just why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself and like I mean just torturing yourself? They see it as torture. And they see it as you're not giving them importance, you're not giving them like enough time to spend with and this and that. So they don't understand the routine and they don't understand the discipline. So yeah, I'm not perfect. I, I stuck at relationships. It's <laughs> and it's not only about being perfect, um, because I mean, it's not only about the flaws, but it's about what it takes to get there and to show that image of themselves or like to, to show people like that top, whatever it is, like that top athlete or that top person. Like, I mean, there is a lot of work in the background that people don't see and they don't realize. It's a sacrifice you're having to make. It I is. Mean, so what being bad at relationships or not being able to hold yeah. a relationship, yeah. it's part of a challenge and sacrifice that you have to accept. Exactly. Because you're so committed to your goal exactly. that everything has to yeah. fall back. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, but it's like it, you kind of have to find a balance at some point. Uh, because you can't stay an athlete your whole life. Like sure. you have to find a balance. But it's like from my side, I find it easier for guys than girls uh, because a guy could get married and like can have his life the way he wants it to be, and then still have that relationship and still can get married and still have kids too because he's not the one being pregnant. Sure. He's not the one who's gonna have the kid for nine months and then having to go through the whole like depression after the pregnancy and getting back in shape and this and that. So the guy have it easier, let's say. Sure. Not easy, but easier than like a female athlete. Sure. So, and we get all the critiques and like we get criticized a lot. You're old, you go get a family, go have a life, 
do this, do that. So it's always something that we have to deal with in a daily basis yeah. and that we have to kind of try to manage in a better way um, to be able to continue. Because it is, believe me, like Kevin, it's so, sometimes it's so shocking and so um, like hard on us that, I mean, we're humans too and we have emotions and we have feelings. So imagine someone that is like, like every day coming to you and be like, go get a life, you're old, why are you doing, why are you doing this to yourself, why this, why that? At one point, you're gonna kind of like believe in that and believe that you actually need to get a life and like you're doing something wrong. Like whatever you're doing at that point, being an athlete is wrong. But Which is why it's yeah. important, I ask the question, how do you protect your mind? Yeah. Right, because it's exactly these things. They're not only our own self-negative yeah. talk, yeah. It's time, people. <laughs> the people around you. Yeah, and people like to actually, like, people don't, like, sometimes people don't like successful ones. Like, if they see you successful, like, I always say, like, I always find this, like, weird or, like, it doesn't, I don't accept it in my mind because if someone is successful, like, the, the way to do is to try to become like them and find the ways how to become like them or, like, try to figure out a way to become like them, but not try to, like, break them down and get them to your level that's it's, it's just not gonna be like in anyone's interest like why would people do that but a lot of people do that like it's most easier. people do it it's yeah. easier so, because if i critique you yeah i don't have to get out of my comfort zone yeah. i'll just try to yeah. break you down at the knees exactly right? which yeah. i can't do anyway but yeah. i'll do it because but, that's my own way yeah. of dealing exactly to feel comfortable of not getting out of my comfort zone yeah. whereas if I, if I aspire to what you're doing mm -hmm. and you inspire me which will be better for both actually it would be better for both yeah. but that would require me to come to a realization hey yeah. what are you doing with your time yeah. stop watching TV series yeah. get out of your comfort zone yeah. wake up earlier mm -hmm. go for a run yeah. that, that list yeah. is very long real yeah, quick true. and very high it is because it's a lot more comfortable to just sit and just flip yeah. on a remote yeah. control and eat a tub of ice cream and, and just bash on people and be like you find the wrong things to say about them, so. which is which is why it's important to protect your mind, yeah. to protect your surrounding. Yeah. Have you taken measures to protect your surrounding? I, because what you're saying is a reality. Yeah, it is. It is. But I mean, I really don't think about it a lot. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a very supportive family that I really find support when I talk to them and find like strength when I talk to them. Um, like I see what my mom is going through and I tell myself, oh, like whatever you're going through is a piece of cake. So um, that's a way of dealing with things sometimes for me. Um, sometimes I just say whatever God is um, like is throwing at me is meant to happen to me and I will accept it and just like I'm accepting. It's like kind of challenge and I accept the challenge and I will try to like move forward and keep moving forward actually. So, um, and being a believer actually helps mm -hmm. because you know that everything happens for a reason mm -hmm. and whatever is meant for you will like will come to you at some point and whatever is not meant for you, you will never get it. So, I'm also a big believer that whatever we face or whatever is handed to us on, on our plate, mm -hmm. uh, we're given it for the reason that we have the capacity. Exactly. Even if we don't believe that we have the capacity at the yeah. moment. Yeah. It's given to us to develop that capacity. True. To yeah. handle it. Yeah. Yeah. So and that has helped me a lot. Yeah. Through my own life challenges. Exactly. Because I mean, just believing like and thinking that way helps a lot. Because yes. you just say that, as you said, whatever is giving to you, you can handle it. Like God will not or like God will not give you something that you cannot handle. Mm -hmm. Like if it's not it's not in God's plan to just like make you like feel weak or make you this or that. So whatever you're actually dealing with, you can deal with mm -hmm. and you can like deal with it in your own way and find a way to actually surpass it and get the best out of it. So. You know, when, when you said earlier about being focused on the goal so much mm -hmm. that, you know, it affects relationships. Yeah. I think that anyone in any domain wants to have a target that they're passionate about yeah. or they go, hey, this is the goal that I want to reach. Mm -hmm. That journey is lonely. It is. It is. It's sad to say that. It's a reality. It is, but it is. It's, yeah. it's a reality that you have to accept 
and do it because if that's not what you want, you shouldn't do it. Exactly. And the reason I see a lot of people quit, and I'd love to get your feedback on this, is I see, for example, entrepreneurs who set up a business and then fail and then they give mm -hmm. up, or you don't have to be an entrepreneur, athletes, yeah. people that try to be an athlete or a professional yeah. athlete, or something happens like not making or working hard and then not being able to qualify yeah. for the Olympics and then they decide, okay, that's it, I've had it with sport. Yeah. They haven't established that clarity of going, hey, I'm doing this for these reasons yeah. that are important to me. And part of this and accepting this, this kind of journey, I have to also accept mm -hmm. that these are sacrifices I need to make. Yes. One of which, that this is going to be a long journey, it's going to be a lonely journey, yeah. And it's going to be a journey where a lot of people won't understand. Exactly. And a lot of people who are going to try to stop you at mm -hmm. some point or another. But as you said, Kevin, like setting those goals actually helps you also understand where you're going. But also, like, even if you don't have, like, you try to do it, like we say in French, uh, avec les moyens du bord. So with whatever you One have. More time. <laughs> One more time. One more time because it sounded really good. <laughs> so you do it avec les moyens du bord. Which means you do it with whatever you have, like Ooh, that's, that's with good. you. So, um, so it's like, for example, I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Because being an athlete, a Middle Eastern athlete or like an Arab athlete, it's not always easy. And I told you that, like when we talked before, is that I'm a self-supported athlete. Like I don't have sponsors, so it's like I have to work to do what I love. And if I don't work enough, I'm not gonna have enough money to just do what I love and compete where I want to. And that's why probably like my calendar is mostly like local competitions, not international competitions. Local camps, not international camps. So um, so being a self-supported athlete is not always easy. But it's like, I know with like, I tell myself that you know that you are supporting yourself. So deal with it and do the best that you can do. So when I compete, it's like I'm not gonna compare myself to the pros because being a pro is just like eating, sleeping, and training. And like their There's life, no time to work. Exactly. Right. Their life is actually being an athlete. So they work at being an athlete. For us, it's different. We work like a job, an actual job. And, and then we do the sport on the side. But I mean, I would love to be a pro athlete, but like at this point, I cannot be. But where like, are the sponsors? <laughs> Where are the sponsors? If you're watching this or you know someone or you're listening to this, watch it. She's beautiful. Aww. She's got brains. She's a hard worker. She's got the results to back it up. Where are the sponsors? Seriously. This is the kind of person you should be sponsoring. So, but that that's what made the difference between European athletes and like, I mean, first world athletes and like, I don't want to call our countries as third world, but we are actually third world. I mean, we're classified as third world. Mm. So, uh, but that's the difference between, let's say, the Middle Eastern athletes and the European and American and Australian and British athletes. Because when they're pro athletes, when they decide to become pro, they get the support of their federation, their country, or they get like sponsors. And they work as athletes. So their whole life is just like being an athlete. For us, no. It's like we have to prove ourselves, and when you prove yourself, you still have to prove yourself again, and then you still have to prove yourself again. And even though you prove yourself so many times, you still don't get the sponsors because the sponsorship here is only for collective sports, which are like mainly football, and then sometimes basketball and handball, and they don't get much either. Um, but we don't have the culture of like sponsoring athletes and individual sports athletes to reach whatever they want to reach and to become better athletes actually so um but it's it's like a whole subject to talk about it's not it's not like something I, uh, since you mentioned it is this something that i know that for example in the states or in europe mm -hmm. they have these kickstarter campaigns yeah have athletes tried that have no, you looked into I it i don't think so no to no. work out okay yeah. in order to be a pro athlete this is the budget required mm -hmm. which yeah. is what is it Generally speaking, is there a range or? And there is. It depends on the sport too. Okay. So it really depends on the sport because there are some sports that like you need more equipment and the equipments are expensive. Sure. Like let's say in rowing, you need a boat. Yes. And the boat is like what five to ten thousand euros. So in triathlon, it's a little bit less. In swimming, it's only the technical suit that you sure. need. 
So, but then it's like the living expenses because you're actually not gonna work. You're just gonna be an athlete. Absolutely. So everything has to be paid for. Right. And um, that's that's how it works. So in order to do that, and in order to be focused on the sport that you want to do, you have to have everything paid for, pretty mm-hmm. much. And having like that support that you need, and actually being able to live, and not just like thinking how you're gonna finish the month and how you're gonna go to that competition and like how you're gonna save for this competition. So it's it's a completely different mindset. So yeah. a real challenge. Yeah, it is. It is. It's just. But like, I go back to what I said. Like, I accept that, and I just go and train and do my best with these like moyen uh, du So with these things that I have, like with these capabilities that I have. But I don't. I'm not gonna pretend that I have more. Because for now I don't have it, and I just I actually I only live with what I have. You make do with what you have. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm not gonna be like, oh, when I get a sponsor, I will train. No, it doesn't work like that. Because you might never have a sponsor. So are you gonna relate your training to having a sponsor? You're never gonna start. So and some people do it that way because it's the easy way also to think. So or like you relate your failure to. To not having a sponsor. I didn't make it because I didn't have a sponsor. Exactly. Or I didn't have enough time. Like you will always have enough time to train. Maybe not training with the best because you don't have like the money to go and train with the well, best. Exactly. Yeah. But you can train your best wherever you are, and then do your best with what you have, and then like do whatever you can. Like compete at your best and hope for the best too. <laughs> so because sometimes even if when you do everything perfectly. You get to the competition day and something happens, mm. and you have to accept that too. So you could have food poisoning, like I had in the world, like the last world championships. Right. So, um, but I like I sat down and I was like, okay, you only did two swims, you still have three to go. Are you gonna just give up because you had a food poisoning? So you're or, at an event. Yeah. You you've trained for this event. Mm-hmm. You arrive at the event. Yeah. You get food poisoning. Uh huh. Yeah. Lucky for me, I had two swims and then I had three to go, and I had the food poisoning after the second one, like the night of the second one. Okay, and so, then you just take the next three off. Well, I mean, it was just dropping the other three off yeah. or sucking it up and just like going with it. So I chose the second option. So that's when I got the first bronze. It's like the the day I got the food poisoning, and then I went to the hospital at night. Spent the night at the hospital. And then when the next morning and swam, won gold, went back to the hospital, <laughs> spent like all, did all testing, all kind of testing, and then had a day off, and then finished my last event, which where I had the, my last gold. So I'm just thinking how if our days were put side by side, how interesting it would look. <laughs> <coughs> woke up, <coughs> woke up got food poisoning. I woke up at breakfast. Uh, oh my God. Went, went, yeah, yeah, went to the hospital. Um, went to work, um, came out of hospital, won a goal, went home, watched Netflix, <laughs> went back to the hospital, slept, woke up, won gold, <laughs> just went to work, and I was complaining that I had a tough day. <laughs> you just embarrassed yourself when you, when you told her, oh, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> just I am totally inspired. Thank you, guys. But Thank embarrassed. You. No, usually I'm, to, <laughs> I'm reassessing my entire life right now as we're speaking. Yeah, true story. You shouldn't. You should get inspired and just try to do better. One hundred percent. Oh, one hundred percent. This embarrassment is not negative at all. That's good. Just considering it's in public now. <laughs> this is. This is. This is. Yeah, this, it's not negative at all. It's you. And I'm glad I get to do this because now it's just a constant reminder. I mean, I get to work with great individuals like yeah. CEOs and world leaders. But you know you're just 30, and what you're doing, and when I'm thinking about your mindset, it's so easy. It's so easy to go, oh, yeah. if I only, if only I had the sponsorship, I know I've got yeah. the talent and hard work to do it. Yeah. If only I had the sponsorship, it'd be this. If only it was like this, I'd be that. If only, yeah. and we end up living our lives with if only. If only. Yeah. Countless people I've yeah. seen because of if onlys, they have not reached their potential, and you can see that, like you have so yeah. much potential, exactly. and purely they didn't have that 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 one line that you said. Yeah. I'm gonna do the best that I can with what I've got. Exactly. Get inspired. Imagine if you could present yourself, your thoughts, and your ideas with clarity and confidence.
Imagine if you could speak to influence and impact. Imagine if you could communicate like a commanding and charismatic leader. Well, you can, given the right information and the investment of effort from your end. How do I know that? As a public speaking coach, I work with CEOs, world leaders and presidents. And when they hire me, they expect nothing short of results. And over the years, it's been two decades now, two challenges have risen for me being unable to help the majority of people. I'm usually on a plane, with the majority of my time being booked a good year or two in advance. And my one-on-one -on -one session to work with someone in person generally starts at $20,000. So we solved the problem by making my public speaking course available for you online. Everything that I teach my clients when I'm working one-on-one. -on -one. Thoughts, tips, strategies, how to do things, all on video, all sequenced in the right order for you to be able to watch, re-watch, practice and refine your presentation, your speaking and your overall communication skills. And guess what? You will get results. Now, you can have this course, not for the $20,000 that my clients pay me when we work one-on-one, -on -one. you can have it for $9.97. That's right, just $9.97. You might be thinking, well, why are you offering something that you charge $20,000 for, for $9.97? It's simple, because those who want to work with me one-on-one -on -one will still hire me. But for many whom I might be out of their budget, this is a great way to develop their communication skills, to cut through the noise, to rise above the rest, and to beat their competition. If you're serious about wanting to develop your skills, to be able to present your thoughts, your ideas, and yourself with clarity and confidence, to be able to speak, to influence and impact, and to communicate like a confident and charismatic leader, then this course is for you. Go on to kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash course and get started today. Yeah, and that's how it should be. That's how it should be for everyone in every single discipline, like not only in sports, but everywhere else. Like I started my company now, but I mean, I started with a small budget and I'm trying to do like it's sports services, sports equipment and consulting, like sports consulting. But it's like, I'm not gonna lie to myself and be like, okay, I'm gonna land a $1 million on 1 million dirham like, like contract. No, I know that like with what I have now, I cannot do that, but I'm working towards that. That's that's a goal that I wanna reach like at some point too. So um, being it. truthful with yourself and realistic is that's what good. actually is all about. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'm a slow learner. It's okay. just the reality of it. Um, when I when I do something, it takes me a long time to get into the groove, and I, I've also realized my self talk, and I'm okay with it now. That uh, it takes me a while to get to a point where I go, okay, cool, I'm good at this. Okay. So when I started dancing, mm -hmm. um, I do urban kizomba. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, I danced for 14 months before I truly started enjoying it. And every time I'd have friends, they'd be like, oh, you know, it doesn't seem like you're having fun, or yeah. why are you this, or I'd just tell them that, oh, no, I didn't have fun tonight. They're like, why not? You know, you're dancing, it's fine. Yeah. And it was because I had a vision of myself like, at the level that I perfect, could be doing yeah. it. Yeah, or just at a certain level mm -hmm. where I could see, for example, I had a vision of that dance, of how it would be, yeah. or how the evening would be, how I would dance, how I would interact mm -hmm. when I'm asking a lady to dance with her and so forth. And it took me 14 months to get to that point, and once I arrived at that point, I haven't stopped learning, okay. but it's the point where I started enjoying myself. Okay. Um, said that, I had become good, right? because I, I like, I'm quite critical of myself. Yeah. Uh, it's helped me back in, on many occasions, but it has also helped me become good at whatever I choose to do. Um, the same with speaking. It's taken me years to then be able to confidently say that I'm darn good mm -hmm. at this skill, yeah, yeah. right? So this is without the ego because <clears throat> there are many who will just walk up and go, hey, I can speak, yeah. I can rah rah, mm. that makes me great. Good for you. <laughs> but for me, again, I had a certain vision of a mm -hmm. skill of how to connect with the audience, the engagement level, driving the message. 10 years later when we meet, even if you forget my name, you will remember the message I shared with you, yeah. which has happened on, on many occasions now. And to me, that was the 
the minimum standard that I wanted to get to, mm -hmm. to be as a speaker. But it took me a long time because for some people it takes them, you know, there are theories that say, hey, if you do 40 hours of intense work, you get mm -hmm. to a certain minimum level. Yeah. There is that 10,000 hours mm -hmm. <coughs> that became super popular with Malcolm Gladwell when he mentioned that 10,000 concentrated hours makes you a certain level. I've spoken with athletes, I've spoken with comedians, I've spoken with people in different genres and they go, almost all of them say that it takes a few years for them. Mm -hmm. When they look back, they realize, yeah, year six or seven is when I really got into yeah. my thing. You don't seem to fit that mold. I've said <laughs> all this to say that you just seem to be quick at grasping it. God's gift? Maybe. Okay. Mom's gift, dad's yeah. gift. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I I know that I'm a fast learner, but that's not, um, I'm not going to use that as an excuse or a reason to just say, uh, to just like work less hard. Um, I'm a hard worker too. Yes, I'm a fast learner, but I'm a hard worker. And when I want something and I put my head into something, I just work as hard as I can to reach what I want to reach. Mm. So um, it's not about being a fast learner or a slow learner, like a slow learner. Um, because if you want something and you really want it, you're just gonna do whatever it takes to get that thing. Mm. So either it takes you one hour, one month, one year. Everyone has different paces at everything. Like, I mean, that's what makes us different. Absolutely. And that's what makes people like interact together and be different and different things and like be like um, I mean like it, it's just it's just learning at a different pace right. but it's not a reason like for me for example yes so people are gonna so we go back to that question where like people are saying oh so you're an athlete you can do whatever you want of course. no it's not oh you're a fast learner so you can do easy for, uh, like, you. Easy for you no it's not easy I mean like we talked about how I was falling off the, like the boat, um, like swimming. I I went through all the steps of swimming, um, cycling. I fell multiple times from the bike to be able to be comfortable. It took me a while to just like get the fear of falling off the bike and then standing on the bike holding my water bottle. Like I used to do sessions, like one hour sessions, one hour and a half without drinking because I was scared of just like taking my hand off the like off the bike and then holding the water bottle. So at some point I was like, okay, we need to drink, we need to hydrate. So I bought a Camelback. And then slowly and just like going and trying harder and falling, I just learned how to hold my water bottle and I was hydrating better and I was like doing better. So it really doesn't matter how long it takes you to learn something or to master something that you want to do. But it really, you need to put the work and the hard work and to put the, the effort to get to where you want to. You had an accident? Many, multiple. <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> you want to have a list, it's like, but you see like the thing is, I, I don't like to talk about my accidents, but I do at the same time because I actually want to talk about after the accident, not the accident itself. So yes. I don't want to focus on the accident, yes. but I want to focus on what I did after the accident. Yes. Just to make people understand that it's actually not failing, but I mean, having accidents, it happens. Like it happens to anyone. And in sports, it's part of the sport, like yeah. having accidents. But actually giving up after the accident is the easy way. Or just finding excuses because of the accident is the easy way. But going back and working hard and doing what it takes to get back and become better than before the accident is the hard way. And But it is possible. It's not like impossible because if I can do it, if other people can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah. So um, I used to be 20 kgs heavier and um, at that point the gym wasn't my friend and I, you know, working out and stuff wasn't, wasn't in, the, in the plans. Um, I would look for every excuse. Yeah. Oh, I think I hurt my ankle. Well, that's the gym out of, out of today. Oh, I think I'm whatever. Yeah. My finger, even though I'm not going to use my finger, it's leg, it's leg day. Can't go to the gym because my finger hurts. See? Yeah. And that was because I didn't have a goal or it wasn't yeah. part of my lifestyle. Yeah. Um, whereas today, going to the gym, it feels good. It's not a yeah. chore. Yeah. I want to do it. 
regardless of what happens. Yeah. Uh, there have been many cases where I shouldn't be at the gym. I yeah. still do it. Not that I'm, I'm not at yeah. any level of you know, professional athlete or intensity level mm-hmm. or what have you. But for me, it's become the habit, the association, because yeah. it's just part of who I want to be and live on a daily basis. Yeah. Oh, I just want to be a healthy person. Yeah. Um, what goes through your head? You had an accident where when we weren't shooting, you were saying that... I'll take you through all the accidents okay. that I had. This was interesting, but it just got me going, wow. <laughs> yeah. So the one where you were riding a bike and you go... I'll take you before, before, for, for, that, before okay. that one. Right, uh, 2012, before the Olympics, three weeks or a month before, I had a hole in my lung. So that's actually, I'm saying it right. I'm not just saying something wrong. I had a hole in my lung. Not metaphorical, actually. No, actual hole in my lung. So the air was not circulating inside my lung. It was circulating outside of my lung. And actually it was circulating in my body and it was very dangerous because I could have died from it. And it went up to my neck and I had like air bubbles in my neck, which was like very dangerous. (laughs) And I stayed with it for like two days and then went to the doctor. But that's not the point. The point is, okay, I had a hole in my lung, but then I was decided that I was going to go to the Olympics. It was out of question for me to just give up on the Olympics because I had that hole. So I took days off and I went back to training slowly and then I traveled and then I went to the Olympics and I competed at the Olympics. Yes, I didn't compete the best that I wanted because of that accident and because actually it was not the accident, it was the fear of having that hole open up again. Sure, sure. So, but I competed at the Olympics. But still you went. I still went and I still competed and I was like, even if like, I remember at that point I was telling myself, even if you go on a wheelchair, you're going to those Olympics. Like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and it might not come again. So you're going like hole in the hole, you're going. So, um, so yeah, so that was number one. I mean, number big, big number one, because before that there were a couple. And then, um, so the other one was uh, 2018, March 2018. I was, uh, that's when I decided to start triathlon. I was rowing, I, it was my second season of rowing. And so 2017, I was uh, UAE national champion and Tunisia national champion. And it was like in the middle of the rowing season in 2018. And I decided to start trying triathlon. So I took a bike and I was cycling. It was a Thursday. And I was supposed, that morning, I was supposed to cycle, a quick cycle, and then go to Abu Dhabi to start and do my first triathlon. It was March 1st. (laughs) I go out on a cycle and I got hit by a car. (laughs) It was the guy's fault, but thank God I was wearing my helmet, wearing everything. I was like legal and everything. So believe me, Kevin, I saw my life going like in front of me. So, and I saw my career just stopping right there. And I didn't know what happened to me. I just had a really bad pain in my shoulder and I was like crying because I didn't know what happened to me. Like it was so fast and so quick that I didn't know. But so I went, had the surgery in Tunisia, had a plate in my shoulder. They you had, had broken your shoulder. I broke my collarbone. Oh, wow. uh, so my collarbone broke and it broke up like in a pyramid shape. So they had to, I had to go back to Tunisia. They had to break it again because the bone started healing. Put a metal plate over, four screws. <laughs> a month later, I was rowing. Of course, that's what we all do, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I was rowing in Abu Dhabi for like uh, the second to last round of the championship. Because I, at that point, we have seven rounds. I did four rounds and I, I was like first in the rankings, like in the overall rankings. Because when I rowed, I rowed in the single, the woman double, the woman quad, the um, the double mix and the quadruple mix. So five events at every round, you had like five events. So I used to do all five and I used to like, hang the left one, all five. So um, when I had the accident, it was the week after that we had round number five. So I missed that one. But for me, it was out of question to lose my championship because I won it the year before. So I was like, I'm not, I'm not losing. So I went, competed in Abu Dhabi and the last round I competed in Sharjah. It was hard, like I'm not gonna say it was easy. Like I couldn't, raise my hand up, but I could do a limited rowing movement. So, so you weren't healed? <laughs> I was not, no. I was still with the plate, I couldn't move my arm. I was at the, like, at, I was seeing my physiotherapist every other day and he was taping my arm, like every single kind of tape that he could do to just like 
keep me in a limited movement that will not hurt me. I I've seen not. people who could barely do this and they'd be like, I need to call sick today. To work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my right arm won't go all the way so, up. Because yeah. when I tell you it was a month after the surgery, I had the surgery March 13th and I was competing April 10th. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so I did that and then in Sharjah, I did it like three weeks later. And I won, like, at, I reached my goal and I won the national championships. Yes, I didn't do like five gold medals across because it was not easy still, like, and I had to cancel, like, I had to, like, scratch from one event because I passed out on the beach actually that day on the last round. But for me, it was, it meant the world to me to win that championship. And my team needed me also because my coach called me and he was like, Sarah, if you can row, come and row. Like, we cannot afford not having you on the team. So, no pressure. No pressure, right? <laughs> so that was number two. And number three, I was competing. I um, traveled, that was a couple months ago. That was uh, like two weeks before Ramadan this year, 2019, April 13th. Um, I traveled to Kuwait to do an aquathlon and a triathlon weekend. Um, so I... I don't even know what that means. Okay, the aquathlon yeah. is swimming and running. Okay. So you swim and you run. That's aquathlon. Triathlon is swim, cycle, and run. I'm sweating just. <laughs> so just at the thought of all this. So I was supposed to do an aquathlon uh, relay on Friday and a triathlon on Saturday. The relay was just like for fun to just like get into the competition. I did the relay on my own. So the relay is supposed to be two person. So you do a swim run and then you tag your friend and he does a swim run again. Mm. I did the relay on my own. So I was my my own relay yeah. team so i do the first run the first swim and on the way back like i mean the first swim and the first run at the end of the 2.5 run i started hurting like my legs started hurting um so i was like oh it's nothing it's okay i swim i could barely move from the water out of the water to like go and put my shoes on oh, no. and then but i mean silly me i didn't stop <laughs> And I don't know if it was courage or if it was what, but uh, I didn't stop. I ran 2.5k with like just going limping on one leg to the right because it was the left one. And then I had a sprint at the end. I just, it happened to me to just like sprint at the end because a guy was catching up to me. Oh no, we can't, we can't have that <laughs> one. I can't have that one, right? <laughs> so I sprinted. I went to the finish line and I couldn't step on my leg anymore. So, and everyone was like, good job, great, you're so good, you're great. I came fifth overall out of 23 teams, doing it by myself. So, <laughs> and then I couldn't step on my foot. And I was willing to do the triathlon tomorrow if it felt better, but it was not feeling better. I couldn't sleep that night. And then it happened to be like a stress fracture. Um, that I had on my like in my leg. Um, went back on a wheelchair. Right just sitting here. <laughs> went back on a wheelchair to Dubai, and um, I had to do like all kinds of things. And I was sitting at home like with my leg up for like a week. I was so depressed because I couldn't train and do anything. But in the plans, like I was like I mean I was planning to do world championships like in August. So I was like, okay, what do we do? What do we do? Like, are we gonna do it or not? But for me, it was not an option to just like not go to world championships because I wanted to go to those national world championships and Ramadan was two weeks later so I had a broken leg Ramadan came I was fasting but I got back to training and I trained really hard like I was cycling I mean when I like at first I was just doing upper body and when I was able to get back to the pool I was just pulling in the water but my leg was still hurting so I was like I would like wrap it with a band so I don't move it and then just like do like arm training and then it got better little by little got back into training managed to go to world championships and win world championships get inspired you know this by now that we are the number one YouTube show slash podcast that's coming out of the Middle East from Dubai. If you like the idea of having your brand reach at least a million eyeballs per episode, then feel free to reach out to my office on kevinabdurrahman.org. Without further delay, let's continue this great conversation. So all of this, I'm not like, I don't want to talk about these and I'm not bragging about anything, but I just want to tell people that everything is possible. 
and nothing is impossible like we are human yes but our minds are very strong and our bodies are even stronger but we just have to believe in ourselves i mean you're not just, just saying it. it this is the talk yeah. you have with yourself yeah yeah and because for me leading is that leading by example is the best way to lead people actually so we don't preach for things you just lead by example you show people that it's yes. actually doable yes. and you do it so then people can believe in you and can yes. believe that they can do it because you did it so you know when you were saying that <laughs> one you were your own team and you just kept on going even though it was clear that you should have stopped yeah it reminded me of a story that i shared with many about john stephen aquari Okay. It's 1968. Mm -hmm. It's the Summer World Olympics, okay. and they're doing the marathon. Mm -hmm. 74 start the marathon. Yeah. Well, a marathon is like 42 kilometers. Oh it's, God. You know how how hard it is. I have absolutely no idea because I don't plan on doing one. But of the 74, <laughs> hell no. It teaches you like. I'm sure. I'm sure it's going to teach me <laughs> life, les life lessons right through. But of the 74 people that started, only 57 finished. Okay. And I wish I could tell you, like, John Stephen was, you know, first. Yeah. He wasn't. Like, he didn't even make the rankings. No. But the reason I'm sharing it is because they started giving out the awards. Mm -hmm. So first place, second place, third place. The organizers give the awards. Yeah. You know, it, was, it finished in a stadium. So people from the stadium go, oh, yeah, everyone's come through. We've given out, we've done the ceremony. And they start, they're start. starting to leave. Yeah. Only then they notice that oh, there's I'm someone that's hobbling, oh. still, you know, yeah. hobbling towards the stadium. An hour and a half later, oh God. this guy is hobbling, yeah, comes finish. into the stadium to finish. Yeah. What had happened was early on, he had actually taken a fall. Oh God. He had dislocated his knee. Whoa. Can you imagine? Yeah. A marathon, a knee is needed. Yeah. Like you exactly. seriously need to yeah. have your knee. Oh my God. Dislocates his knee, nope, takes Wrap a bandage, up, yeah. wraps it up, continues. Continues, hobbles, 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 42 kilometers. Crosses the finish line, collapses. Then they ask him, they're like, Why did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> you crazy person. Why did you do that? Like, I'm out. Yeah. Like, fall, dislocated knee, most people are out. Yeah. This guy, why did you do that? His reply, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to yeah. Mexico City to start the race. And not my there. country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Exactly. And I feel like I'm speaking to that person. That's just like him. Thank you. No, I that seriously do. Really like, just thinking about you. it, like when you were saying it, I had shivers down my spine. I'm like, mm, <laughs> she is. I said a beast. <laughs> she is really a beast. This is not even metaphorical. Like, <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm I mean, in the most affectionate way. Like that is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. And what I love is exactly what you just said. You're doing it. So when you say it, or you're hoping to inspire exactly. others. It's not like wow, wow, wow. Yeah. It's not like I read a book and here's my speech. Yeah. Let me show you how it how it is. How like, after surgery I could have left my arm up and yeah, but I was yeah. Like I went out there. Mm -hmm. Man, respect, huge amount. Thank of you. Thanks. I've asked you questions and so far it's all about go, go, go. Okay. How do you relax? Do you relax? If you do <laughs> relax, how do you relax? <laughs> I do. Believe me, I do. I mean, hard I, to I, believe. Hard? No, it's not. Uh, well, actually, last weekend I decided not to do anything and take the day off because I needed it. Like, I try. Okay, I'll tell you one thing before, like how to relax, because I know that I push myself sometimes, like beyond limits. That I know that sometimes I need to listen to my body. So when my body tells me you need to stop or you need to rest, I need to like because I know that I will not do it the easy way. Like my coach tells me. I don't know like how to coach you because you don't show pain. Like every time he like gives me something really hard, I smile at him and I do it. And it's true because if you just look back at this yeah. YouTube video, <laughs> you will see that she's talking about accidents and pain yeah. with a smile on her face. I'm cringing on the inside. I'm hurting. She's like, yeah, put a plate on it. <laughs> Won the championship. So it's true. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I feel for your coach. <laughs> So, and I, and I like doing that. I mean, it's not that I like the pain, but I like when I'm given a task, I do it and I do it right and I do it well. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't show pain. Like if I'm going to cry, I will go and cry on my own. Like I'm not going to show you my weakness. Like mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to tell my coach, oh, you broke me today. No, like he, he knows that he will never get that from me. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
But I do relax. Like, I like going, I mean, I live on the beach. I'm lucky enough to live, like, close to the beach, so. You live in Jumeirah, right? Yes, I do. It's, it's a blessing to be it in is. this city. It's absolutely it amazing. It is. So when I feel a little bit down or, like, feel like I don't want to do anything, I just go and sit by the water and listen to the waves. Mm -hmm. That's, like, really my go-to place to just, like, relax and empty my mind and not think about anything. So, um, and you told me where you get your strength, that's where I get my strength from. <laughs> yes. So, uh, but I do love, I mean, I love movies, so I go to the cinema, even I go by myself, because, like, one thing about me is that I don't like people talking in the middle of the movie, so sometimes I just decided to go on my own, <laughs> so no I don't have that person talking next to me and not letting me focus on the movie, yes. but I do go with my friends, too. <laughs> so, um, I like traveling, I love traveling. So I always put on like my bucket list for every year, like visiting at least like two to three countries per year. So um, I'm a traveler. Like I mean, I live kind of like in the five continents so far. So and I love visiting new places and like experience different experiences and meet new people. So um, so yeah. Next destination? What's your? I uh, what, really what you like to plan I, for. Yeah, I haven't planned that yet, but um, I mean, I might be going to Oman because I've never been to Oman. So I might be going to one to compete, and it's close too. So, um, so I might go. Yeah, that's probably the next destination. And how do you pick your destinations? So, what do you look for in new countries? Well, mostly. So sometimes it's because you. it's the competition. Mm -hmm. So I just like plan to go compete and then have like uh, like some fun after it. Um, but my go-to, like the places that I really want to visit, even if I don't have a competition, is Latin America. Okay. I've never been to Latin America. Even if I lived in Florida and I was so close, I've never been. So I really want to take a trip there. Even though you learned Spanish and exactly, in yeah, <laughs> I've been to Spain, but not like not to Latin America. And that's really like one of the like the places that I'm very curious to to experience and to see what it is about, like all those countries, all the Latin American countries. Since I brought up Spanish. English is your third language. Mm -hmm. Arabic is your first. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have Tunisian, so I just uh -huh. want to make like a little note, okay. uh, like side note on yeah. that. That Tunisian is not Arabic. It is Arabic, but it's a broken Arabic. Okay. Mixed with French, Berber, which is the original language of Tunisia, of North Africa. Uh, so it's a mix. It's like we call it Chakshuka. <laughs> so, <laughs> so would you separate that as a language? It, well, some people separate it as a language, some people say it's a dialect, uh -huh. but it is, it is, because when we speak Tunisian, yes. Arab people, I mean, Arab speakers don't understand that. Yes, so, but you are able to converse in Arabic yeah, as Yeah, well. yeah, I do, because I mean, it is like, we're taught in Arabic, so... But. So Tunisian, Arabic, French, you get recruited by University the Flor of University of Florida, uh -huh. you go to Florida, uh -huh. and at that point, how strong is your English? One hour per week. Uh, no, and like in how, a French what school, level but you, I mean that's, oh, that's what, what I'm saying. Done, yeah. Like I, we did it like in a French school. So the French, I mean, no offense to the French system, but we used to speak French in English hours. So and it was only one hour per per week. So per I was week. I was very uh, yeah. I I was trying to get my English level like better just by listening to music, watching like movies in English and things because I knew I was moving to the US like. But it was not close there, to like any anything. <laughs> the reason I ask because that's yeah. a discomfort, and I'm just imagining if someone was to watch the YouTube video or the, download the podcast and they're listening to it, there could be students here who might be thinking, "Yeah, I might have a good future, or I might have a scholarship, mm -hmm. or I might have an opportunity yeah. because a family member is there, or for mm -hmm. whatever reason they're good at something and they're, yeah. uh, they're being made an offer." Mm -hmm. And I've seen situations where because of the discomfort, an opportunity was there and, and, a per and the person didn't take it because they couldn't speak good English. Yeah. Because they felt that it was going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. You have to be. You need to let yourself be uncomfortable. So how, I just want to know, how were you? Like if I, was, if I had met you at that point, would we be able to have this conversation? No, no. Far from that. I remember when I met the coaches in Rome 2009 because I moved uh, August 2009 I met them in July 2009 in Rome at World Championship so they were talking to me and I couldn't answer back uh, I was just like okay did you understand okay I understood okay. I understood but they had to speak very slow like if they were speaking American no way if like British accent that was like even worse what but, language <laughs> are you speaking so but answering no I couldn't answer 
So, and I remember when I landed in Gainesville, where like the University of Florida is, like my roommates came to like pick me up and take me to the dorms. And they were like so excited to meet me and they were like speaking and speaking and I'm like, I was like blanking. And I was, I mean, I was nervous too because I'm meeting these people the first time. And I was like, please, can you speak just like a little bit slower? I'm really not, and I mean, I was not saying it this way either, like, you know? So um, yeah, and the first couple of months were hard because I couldn't understand everything in class and I was allowed to have a translator, like a little translator with me to translate the words that I didn't understand when I had an exam. So it, it was, it's fun to remember now, yes. like what I've been through. And it'll be really good to know what steps did you take? I'm just imagining myself, if yeah. I didn't know English yeah. and I'll turn up there. But English is an easy language though. It is or That's not. what I want to like tell people, please people, English is an easy language. It is. Okay. It's one of the easiest languages to learn. Okay, so. so you arrived there, what steps did you take? Here you are, you're unable to communicate. Yeah, I had to. You had to, but, so what steps did you take? I really, I just... Did I you just, watch TV series? Well, not really, because we were in, I mean, we were in the dorms, we didn't have a TV first, okay. and then we were training, pretty much, like, we had a really strict routine, but um, I, I mean, I was listening to people speaking English, and English was the only language, actually, so that's why, like, but are you it's making known, an effort? I was making an effort and it's known that you only learn a language when you go to the country where the language is spoken because you are forced to speak that language. Yes. Otherwise you cannot communicate. You're, you're just, you're gonna starve, you're gonna like sleep outside, you're gonna this, you're gonna that. So you have to learn it and Out of quickly. necessity. Exactly. And survival. Yeah. So, uh, but I was trying to make an effort to like learn the language. I even learned it like the American way and mm -hmm. I, I was hearing my friends saying like, like, like all the time, like between every word they would say like and I learned it that way, like I learned English that way. So I was like, I, I was not putting like when I learned English, but because they were saying it that way, I was putting like between every word. This because I thought that's the, the way to do it. The how they so, communicate, yeah, right. Yeah. When you look at anyone that's doing well, yep. you don't have to rebuild Mm -hmm. A functioning yeah. wheel. Mm -hmm. You don't, you know, if you're looking at this in business or an yeah. athlete, which is one of the reasons I'm enjoying these conversations. Thank is, you. Um, I'm gonna, I'm already learning so much and having to question many things. And when I review the video and podcast, because I, I tend to do it, I learn so much more the second time around. Right. If we're honest with ourselves and we're serious about wanting to achieve a goal yeah. or a target, the chances are whatever it is that we want to do in life, yeah. it's been done before. Exactly. Yeah. Right? There have been giants who have gone through this journey. Yeah. There, and especially in this day and age, they've left a lot of clues. Exactly. Here's one clue. YouTube. <laughs> and you don't have to start from scratch. Like, do Absolutely. it from zero. Absolutely. So, yeah. And we have that also in swimming or in sports in general. Like our coaches used to tell us, go under the water and see how others are swimming the technique. And they used to say, fake it till you make it. Right. So you actually fake it until you make it. You just try to copy, copy, copy until you do it yourself. So uh, And yeah. obviously visualizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? You, yeah. you visualize yourself. That is based on, yeah. you know, when I think of swimming, now I think of you, but I also yeah. think of Michael Phelps. Mm -hmm. If I was to ever get into the water, yeah. it would be okay. How did he learn? How is he swimming? Or no, yeah. you know, ha now that he has all the experience of having, I don't know, 23 gold medals, yeah. I think it is. Um, what is it that, what would be the tips he would give? Exactly. You know, to. for the shortest distance to be able to, you know, cover that journey. Right. Because yeah. you can learn from so many mistakes. Mm -hmm. You can learn from so many failures. The question is not whether it's available or not. The question is, are you willing to do it? The reason I ask yeah. you is because there are many people, I travel a lot because mm -hmm. of my work, um, growing up again between Dubai and New Zealand, traveled in the States, Europe, Asia. I've seen individuals who've lived in a country for 15, 20 years. They don't speak the language. Yeah, because they could do it like the other way. Because they chose to stay in their comfort uh -huh. zone exactly. and then every decision was based on my comfort zone. Yeah. So if I'm Malaysian, yeah. I'm just going to surround myself with, with Malaysian, Malaysian friends. Yeah. If I'm Arabic, I'm just going to surround myself with my Arabic friends mm -hmm. because why should I get out of my comfort zone exactly. to speak English? True. If I'm, uh, yeah, if, if I'm Persian, I'm mm -hmm. just going to hang out with my Persian friends so I don't have to step out yeah. and actually communicate with the shopkeeper to speak English. Yeah, and as you said, people actually sometimes cancel life-changing plans because they're going to go out of their comfort zone, which is not the way to do it. You've killed your future. Exactly. Yeah. And every potential and everything. Yeah. Hence, I asked, you know, what steps did you take? Because 
it had to be an active decision. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could have, because going to France is one thing, because France is just like an hour and a half away from Tunisia. But going to the US, to the other part of the world, that was very far from home. So I knew that even if I could have, like, you asked me if I could have uh, just went back home and just left everything in France, but like getting to the US, I knew that it was not, it was not, I couldn't do that because it was very far from home first. And second, I didn't go all that way to get there to just like decide to just drop everything and go back. So, um, and I knew that I didn't speak English because at least French, we have it in school and we speak French and I was in a French school. Like when I was in Tunisia, we were like in a, in a French school, like a French system. So I was somehow comfortable. It's You're not comfortable until you actually go to the, com to the country and experience the people who actually speak the language. Yes. Because speaking it in Tunisia is different from speaking it in French. Sure. But going to the US, that was completely different because it's a different country, it's a different culture, it's a different everything. And I was not speaking the language. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, uh, but I had to do it because I wanted to do it first. I wanted to do it. It's not, it was not a decision that someone else took for me. So I took that decision, so I needed to live up to it and to assume what I decided to do and then uh, do what I could to just learn the language as quick as I could. Now, since you mentioned decision, mm -hmm. Take me through your decision-making process. Mm. Like when you're faced with starting up a business, or when you're faced with you know picking up a sport, or when you're faced with having to make a turn or a pivot, how do you think? You know, I'd like to know you know what what questions you ask yourself. What do you, what do you weigh up? Like, are you weighing up pros and cons? Perhaps like the trip, or you could have gone to perhaps from France, you could have gone mm -hmm. to any one of the countries that were a lot more closer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah instead of going all the way to the States. Yeah. Or, so what, yeah, what questions are you asking yourself? You know, what are you looking for when you're making these decisions? That's a good question, actually. I never, because I think it's just automatic in my head right. that I don't actually phrase it or like think it, mm. but I think I brainstorm. Okay. Uh, that's that's the first thing I do. And you then, do it on paper? Yeah, I do it on paper. I'm very visual. Mm -hmm. I believe in like writing. So and I write it. I don't type it. Yes. Because writing that's for me, field. exactly, it's completely exactly different. Like yeah. That's a different. I field. It, because I write it and then I type it mm -hmm. because it's it's two different things. Like typing, you don't feel it. Yes. But when you write it, you actually feel how you wrote it. And you're using so, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of senses that exactly. you're using. So and you don't forget it when you write it or you bring it from your brain to the paper. It's actually a stage there. Like it, for me, that's how it works. Mm. So I brainstorm. I put all my ideas, and then I always have like option A and option B. Like I don't leave myself if I don't have a C too. So I don't only take one option and then just be like, oh, what if this fails? And then I have to like think about it. No, I have A, B, and sometimes C, mm -hmm. and then put as you said the pros and cons. Why do I want to do this? Why I don't want to do it? And then. I, I just like go for the best option. And what's the best option? Because for some people, they will they might do this and then they might take the easiest option. Mm -hmm. What yeah. are you considering in your head when you're looking at the options? Yeah. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. I was asked a couple of weeks ago by a friend of mine, got a message uh, I, and she said, I have two job offers on the table and mm -hmm. I don't know which one to take. Yeah. Yes, I get your question. I don't choose the easy option. I, I had this sim a similar situation like last year when like I had a very challenging job. Uh -huh. It was the same salary. Okay. So the salary it was not a problem. It was a very stable job that is like an office job. I just go in the morning and leave in the afternoon. I'm not requested like I'm I'm not like I'm ahead of a department, but I'm not asked to make big decisions. Mm -hmm. So I just follow whatever they ask me and just like follow how it works, like the hierarchy of the things. And the other job it was, I was going to build a company from scratch. Um, I was going to be the country head and I was, I was asked to do everything from scratch pretty much. So, and guess which one I took. Oh, <laughs> I, I'm sure which one you took. <laughs> so yeah, because for me, this one had more, um, this one was very good and it could have probably got me to where most people tell me that I want to go to. Uh, it was, both of them are like, kind of like related to sports. But this one, like, if I would have done this job, I could have been in a position now to 
do other things and to like move up in like the the swimming let's say the the swimming scale mm -hmm. um and this one i just wanted to try it because it was challenging it was something that i've never done before mm -hmm. it was something that is going to teach me about like how business goes in the uae and maybe later if i wanted to do my own business at least i had this experience and i knew how it works and i know what it takes to have a business um and then I want it. Yeah, it, it was it was more challenging for me. So um, so that's why I chose that one. Was it the right decision? In hindsight, I that's that's a good question. I don't know. Um, as I told you, like both of them were completely different. Yes. That one was very stable, and but I don't regret what the decision I took. It was. Like, yeah, or perhaps I it's early yeah. on to say it based on this decision. Well, I don't like one thing about me. I never regret the decisions that I took yes. because every decision that we take teaches us something. Sure. Even like even if it's a failure, we learn from failure. Yes. Failure is not at the end of the the road. It's actually the beginning of something else. Absolutely. So I even if I like for me because I'm very hard on myself. So if I failed on something during this process in in this job. I know that I will do it better next time, mm -hmm. and I will learn from the mistakes. I will just take what I did well, move on with it, and then learn from the mistakes and try to do them better next time. Mm -hmm. So, which and it was not a failure. Like I'm, I'm just saying that this one I would have just been like an employee. Here, I'm a decision maker. So, and for me, I'm not a follower. Uh, it's, it's just it's, yeah. It also seems like it's in line with your vision of what you said. It'll give you the experience so exactly. that if you do wish to start your business, yeah. you're quite familiar yeah. with how things exactly. go. Yeah, which I did after that. There you go. I was like, if I could do it for someone else, I can do it for myself. Sure. And um, yeah, and now, thank God, I have my own business. I mean, it's starting slowly. I'm taking my time to do everything Is there right. Anything she cannot do. <laughs> she wishes to mention it. We will get to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll get to mention it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. I just, um, I'm, I just want to take my time to do things right and take my time to do everything um, in a good way and start things slowly and having like a good base and then building from there. So, you do your decision making mm -hmm. and you do it based on whatever can give you the best growth uh -huh. or get you towards you know the mm -hmm. vision you have yeah. of yourself. Yeah. I've made plenty of wrong decisions, right? so but yeah. I've learned from them. Exactly. Right? I'd like to know is when you made your decision and it was wrong, mm -hmm. how did you assess and adjust and move on? First, I because think, you can cry about it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I mean, that's the easy thing. You cry about it and then you'll be like, oh, For I me, failed. Yeah. I'm stupid or whatever. No, it is, yeah. But no, I take ownership first. Okay. Of it, it was a bad decision. Exactly. It was a bad decision, and then as I told you, I just. Take, because it's even if it's a bad decision, something was good in it. Okay. Like you, you didn't do everything wrong. Like you can't do something a hundred percent wrong. Like. But how do you even adjust? Even if it's a ten percent, right? Yes. You take that ten percent and try to like shift or even start something completely new. Like if that's completely failed and you cannot correct it, you try to correct. Like the first thing is like you try to correct it. Mm -hmm. But if it's not, if you cannot correct it, you just try something. Else. So can you give me an example, whether it's been in life, in business, or in your sport, mm -hmm. where you've taken a strategy, because this is something mm -hmm. we all have to do, we're yeah. continuously working on a strategy yeah. of something that gets us a, a strategy as a sense of direction towards vision. Yeah. And you're there, and you've done a bit of work to it, mm -hmm. this could be a month, it could be a year, yeah. it could be 10 years, yeah. but at some point you realize, hey, this strategy with my overall thing, whether it's because I've changed, yeah. whether it's because the vision has changed, or mm -hmm. whether it's the vision that's the same, but this strategy is not getting us there. Yeah. What do you do at that point? How long does it take you to accept this is the wrong decision? Mm -hmm. How long does it take you to come to that realization? Do you have some sort of a routine where you readjust and then deploy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... I, I mean, I mentioned that example earlier when like, I moved from one side to another oh, yes. in France. Um, it took me a summer to think about it. Okay. So, so you take your time. Generally yeah. Speaking, yeah. 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 Like yeah. Because I mean, it's not like it's not good to make decisions just like out of nowhere or just like overnight. You just sleep on it and then you make the decision. No, sometimes it's like it's 
a recipe for failure because you cannot like you have to give it some time. You have to keep trying. So that was the re like that was for me in 2000 like between 2004 and 2006 I was with one club and I was training but I saw that I was not I moved to France to improve but I was not improving. Mm -hmm. I was just stuck and I couldn't improve. So I needed to do something about it. So I took the summer of 2006 to think about it and while I was thinking about it, I was looking at other options. So I contacted the schools in other places, and then I talked to my mom, and then, I, because I knew that this, I gave it a chance, and I gave it a while to try to make it work, and it was not working. So for me, it was decided that I'm leaving, but I needed to make a good decision to leave, and where to leave, like, whether I go back to you know, like, we got to a point with my mom, is that she said, if you leave there, I, will, I told her, it's either I move from Luz, that's where I was, or I stop swimming. So I, I challenged her to the, like, to the limit, so she couldn't say no, like, because she will not tell me stop swimming, so she would have to let me go to the other place. So, um, and then she was happy that I took that decision, <laughs> because for me, I don't take decisions on, like, I, I build my decisions on actual, like, facts. Yeah, to more exactly. About yeah. Calculated person, yeah. not just yeah. the gut. I feel like this oh, is no. the right thing. Let's just roll no. with it. No, as I told you, like for sports, for example, I don't like choose sports out of nowhere. Like, yes, I like trying different sports, but uh, like with like within some limitation. You know, it's all water sports. Like there's swimming, there's rowing, there's triathlon. They're all endurance sports. They all involve swimming in them. Um, like I, I love. Pentathlon, modern pentathlon, which is um, so horse riding, fencing, swimming, running, and shooting. I know I'm good at running and swimming, and I tried shooting, which I was good at. I tried fencing, I was good at, and it was only horse riding I needed Seriously. to learn. <laughs> so that's actually because, like, but, but this is yeah, smart strategy on what we have. It is because I mean. We, we need to be smart about our decision yes. making. Like we cannot just make decisions just to make a different decision. You oh, know? I want to yeah. become a great basketball player. Exactly. Yes. Like I, f I feel like doing this today or yeah. I feel like doing that today. No, it's not. Like you have to make decisions based on something, yes. based on precedent, like they do in law, you know? Yes. So it's, so that's how I do in my sports and in business too. So I didn't just go out of nowhere. I'm like, oh, I'm starting my own company. Yes. I was a consultant since I moved here, like since I worked with the Swimming Federation, I was a sports consultant. I built a company from scratch for someone else, so then I knew I had what it takes mm -hmm. to start my own company. And I didn't start a company in like a restaurant. I'm starting a company in sports consulting, in sports services, and sports equipment, which will help me get to where I want, let me have like an entity that can help other athletes, whatever I couldn't have. I want to make other athletes have it. Yes, so, and it's so yeah. important because it's it's that sweet spot of yeah. understanding, okay, it's not just passion. Mm -hmm. Because I have a passion for singing, I'd love to sing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the voice for it, like, yeah. out. You have to be, as I know, you have to be realistic with yourself yeah. and just like be well, honest. Whereas you've got yeah. the clarity of, hey, it's important to have yeah. the two. Like, I'm passionate about this. Exactly. My skill set allows me. And I studied it. Like I, I kind of like before even deciding to start the company because I had this idea for a while. Like it's not, it didn't come like in two months or three months. I had this idea since I was studying in the U.S. Like I always wanted to have my own business. Like when I moved to the UAE, this like this thing grew in me. Like I wanted to have my own business. And then I got involved in the swimming federation. I'm an athlete. I studied like the international relations. And then I did international business. Like everything, like I tried to do was building towards getting that company started and like more. Yeah, so if you tell us more about what it is that you're doing now, so it's called SL Sports Services. It's Sarah Lesna. <laughs> so I'm just using my name. Um, it's so I have like five main topics, which is um, athlete support, so exclusive athlete support which goes from um, helping athletes to move abroad, like Middle Eastern. So I'm focusing on like Arab and Middle Eastern athletes. Yes. Um, so moving abroad, like getting recruited by universities uh, in the UK or in the US. So supporting them, helping them through how yeah. to get through. So through the whole, the whole process, process and then following them through too, like not just dropping them there 
and le leaving them by themselves. Mm -hmm. Because most of the federations here, or even the parents that want to send them kids, um, they don't know how to do it first, sure. and they don't know how to follow up. And usually sometimes, like most of the times, they don't speak the language. So it's harder for parents to communicate with the coaches or the entity itself, like the university, because they don't speak the language. And the great thing is you've actually experienced it from the ground up. Exactly. So As an athlete, as a person, yeah. interactions with the coach, what's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. And that's what that's I want to give back. It's, it's really like whatever I had as experience, I want to give it back to those athletes. And yes. I want to share my experience with them. And I want to give them the opportunity to grow and to be better athletes. So it goes from that, like sending them, uh, to exchange programs, like uh, bringing athletes here and sending athletes before the college, before getting to the university, just going on exchange programs to high schools and experiencing like the like how it is outside, how people train mm. in the US or in the UK or in Europe. Yeah. Um, so that, and then uh, doing clinics, like uh, swimming clinics or triathlon clinics, uh, technique improvements. So that's the athlete part. And then we have the consulting part where it goes to the company uh, level. So it's um, from like building um, sports academies from scratch, building the academy, uh, like doing uh, and managing the academies. Um, and then we have also, so that's that. And then consulting, doing business development for the academies, for the clubs, and uh, supporting the sports councils in the region. So. Uh, and this is all on your website? Mm -hmm. This is on the website. The website is going to be launched in October, okay. hopefully. So beginning we of October. We will make sure that whenever this is released, yes. if it's before or after, what uh -huh. have you, the link will be made yeah. available in the show notes. So if you're watching Definitely. this video, the link will be made available in the description. Yeah. If you're listening to the podcast, the link will be made available there. Uh, apart from all that, I'll probably get on the Instagram stories and hit you up with all of that. Perfect. I'm getting off with this whole um, <laughs> social media, man. We live in a world that's full of distractions. Um, this day and age, social media seems to have taken everyone's attention. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I've seen CEOs act like little girls <laughs> on, on social media just because they feel like they need to do it and share what they're yeah. having for dinner. Mm. Not really interested, who cares? Yeah. But hey, this is the way the world is, is going. We live in a world that's high on distraction. You know, and there are so many different elements. Yeah. If it's not your kids at home, if it's not your work, if it's not your email, if it's yeah. not the social media, just so much. How do you stay focused? I keep it within the limits. I'm not really a social media person. Okay. I'm not because I don't want, you know, like, as you said, there are a lot of distractions and I'm sorry to say that, but there are a lot of fake people mm -hmm. on social media, especially on Instagram. Like anyone can just like do this and be like an influencer or be like something that they're not. And people tend to put only the positive on social media sure. like they don't they don't like to show their weaknesses or like if them having a bad day no one's gonna talk about having a bad day so they're all gonna be like pink and roses and blue skies on social media I'm not like that I why I said I keep it within the limits so I don't post very often and even if I post it's either like I post for like a competition or um, or I mean I do put some things uh, but I'm not like the I'm not very focused on social media like I don't care if I got like 10 likes or a thousand likes I I know that the people who are following me they are following me and they're liking whatever I'm putting there and um, those people that little niche that I have of people that are talking to me and texting me probably or saying you are inspiring us or you're good keep doing what you're doing they don't need to be like a million or two million for me to feel that I'm doing something mm -hmm. or that I'm like touching people. Um, so do you have habits? Because one of the things that we do when it comes to productivity, mm -hmm. I, I speak on it sometimes. I can't say that I do it all the time, but when I'm serious about I need to achieve a certain yeah. task or I need to do a certain mm -hmm. thing, yeah. um, not at your level of endurance, but when I need to get something done, I put, mm -hmm. I impose. Yeah like you were saying in terms of limit, I import, impose certain barriers. Mm -hmm. Phone is on airplane mode. Yeah. How do I get hold of Kevin? You don't. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I need to reach him. He will reach to you. Yeah. Um, emails, I don't check it. Yeah. Um, talking to my mom, I don't. Yeah. Even though I love her so much. Mm -hmm. Right? There is this, you moms. know. Oh, moms. <laughs> Seriously, there have been times where yeah. I, I had to close myself off because I need to, I, you need to know yourself and I needed to know yeah. myself, which I did, yeah. was 
I'm highly distractible. Mm -hmm. You put it in front of me, yeah. I'll play for the next 10 hours. Yeah. I don't know, but what I do know, kind of like the sweet tooth, is if it's off and it's away and yeah. it's out, yeah. I'm focused, I'm in the zone, I've got a target I need to hit, let's go. Yeah. So what do you, when you said limits, what do you do? What do you actively do? Well, first, um, I'm not, like, I'm not highly, like, I, I don't get distracted easily. Okay. Um, I remember when I was little, like, my mom even still said it to, till today. Um, like, if I have something to do, I just go into my room and close the door, and I don't come out of my room until I finish. Like, if I have, like, a, a schoolwork or something or a project or anything, like, the weekend, I do that. I go into my room, I close the door, they know that. No, like don't disturb me like I will not open the door and don't even try to open the door So I will not come out of my room until I finish. So you've had this from ch like a childhood yes, focus. Yeah, since I'm very little like no one's life is perfect Yeah, no and, one's life is perfect, but people tend to like to portray their life as perfect. No, we're, we're humans We're not perfect and we don't have perfect lives and it is part of our life to just have ups and downs and it actually the downs make you go higher because you cannot have like monotone life to just like go on a face like if you go down you're gonna go higher so. I can't help because you've been smiling so much and I love it <laughs> it's, it's such a nice feature about you um, that you just feel the energy which is fantastic do you have sad days I do I do but <laughs> I I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I do but I keep them to myself okay so even if I'm sad I'm sad at home but when I come out, I smile to people because it's a conscious thing you do. Yeah, I like to make people happy. Like if I smile at you, you're gonna smile back, and that makes me feel better. Yes, like it makes will. Me feel better, yeah, yes. it will make me feel better even if I'm feeling sad. I make you smile. I mean, it's it's and it's free. You don't have to pay for a smile, you know. So so, um, so yeah. So even if I'm sad, like I do have sad days. And I try to avoid being around people when I'm sad because I don't want to give negative vibes to people or negative energy to people. So, uh, so I try to avoid being out or just like keeping it to myself. So I will just like work out. Like when I'm not happy or like I'm not having a good day, my coach knows. So he sees me. It's like I'm I'm serious. I'm not smiling. He leaves me alone. Like he doesn't talk to me because he knows that's how I roll. Like. Don't bother me, like, I will get better, but don't... You just like, need your yeah, space. Exactly. So, uh, but I, I avoid people. Like, I avoid to be around people, so I don't, like, give them, like, the negative energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we're committed, and you would have experienced this, I'd like to hear what, you know, how do you think, or what do you say to yourself, or how do you reason with yourself? Because commitment, like we touched on earlier, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a lonely journey. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are a lot of distractions as well. Like we said, there are a lot of distractions, but we live in a world today where we see the potential of the world far more than people did 10 years ago yeah. or 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, the tech wasn't there. You couldn't see all the great places yeah. in Latin America mm -hmm. or South America. Yeah. You would have been confined to wherever you are, yeah. your neighborhood, and mm -hmm. maybe just to the country or the continent. Yeah. But today, you get to go, wow, the sunset in Greece looks amazing. <laughs> the drink in... You know, Barbados yeah. looks amazing. <laughs> South Africa, Cape Town, oh my gosh. Yeah. New Zealand, don't even get started, yes. <laughs> right? You have all of that. Mm -hmm. That feeling of missing out. Yeah. Do you get it? Did you get it? I do. Because I, I do. I do. What's your self-talk? When you're working towards a goal where you have mm -hmm. to make commitments, you have to make sacrifice, uh, you can't have great relationships because mm -hmm. of all yeah. of that. And then just to see the world as having fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That feeling of missing out. What's going I do, through your head? I do get that feeling. But uh, when you're committed, you just say to yourself, like, you have to give up things to be able to get what you want. And um, and there's a like there's a time for everything. So now I'm focused. I'm doing what it takes to get to my goal. Those things are not going away. That sunset is there every day. Mm -hmm. That drink is there every day. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever it is, like that hotel is there. Uh, that beach is not disappearing in like a month or a year or two years. So you just, that's why we said you set your priorities because the competition that you're training for, it's not going to be there every day. Like the world championships that I competed at, they're not going to be there every day. 
that there is like if I would have missed it, I would have had to wait for two years to get to the next World Championships. The Olympics is even worse because it's every four years. That's right. So, and in four years, there is a lot that happens. So you could be at the perfect age in this like year, and four years later, there are so many things that could happen to you that you will not be able to to get to that competition. Mm. So, so you just put your priorities, and then you know that these things you're not missing out. You're missing out now, yes, but then you will catch up to these things when you reach your goal, and they will be even better because. The taste of the victory and of like the whatever like you accomplished, it will make you like get these things even better, like feel them even better. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, but it, it is hard sometimes to just like be oh everyone is having fun and I just have to sleep at nine, wake up at five every day and every night and like I don't have a life. But you will do it for a certain time. Like the athlete's career is not that long. Like you know that you will be, let's say, doing your athlete career until this age, and then you're gonna have a life, you're gonna do different things, and you're gonna go, like, your priorities are gonna be different, so... But I think it's important to realize that you're doing it for a reason that you care about. Yeah, of course. Otherwise, you cannot keep up. You won't be able to sustain no, it, No, right? you cannot, because if your reason is not strong enough, you're just gonna drop like halfway through. Mm. Like if you don't have a good enough reason, yes. or if you're not believing enough in it, you're gonna drop it halfway because the priorities change and we change. Like the person can change. Like like within one month, you change like so many times. And like your mindset changes right. with the people that you interact with, with your environment, with everything. So if you have a goal, especially if it's like a long-term goal you really need to like believe very hard in that goal mm -hmm. and believing really really hard that you want to like and why you want to reach that goal and it has to be like a good enough reason for you to be able to like keep it and be consistent at working towards it so how do you deal with disappointment Ooh. i ask because yeah. i was in a long relationship mm -hmm. and when that broke off, it took me three years when I look back at it yeah. for me to recover, if yeah. that's the word or whatever that word is. Uh, when I failed in business, mm -hmm. it took me some time to gain that courage and fearlessness yeah. that I had prior to failing. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's your thing? How do, you, how do you deal with this? Now? For me, I've realized it takes time. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to be able to shake it off like, and let's like say, this. It, it, not like that. It takes a lot of mental strength and just like self, I don't know what it is, like discipline or self-love or like whatever you want to call it, but I can shake it off pretty quickly, but like I go through phases, like failure, okay, I fail, mm -hmm. so I have to accept it, and then I will have that little period where I'm like shutting off a little bit. But sometimes it's not even the failure. Like it's the disappointment, yeah. it's that feeling of self-disappointment. Yeah. I mean, well, self-disappointment is different from an actual disappointment. disappointment. From, I guess, yeah, yeah because disappointment we're the very situation. hard on ourselves. Yeah. yeah, like I'm I'm very hard on myself. Like sometimes I want to overachieve. So I could be like people from the outside would see me like doing great things. But for me, with myself, between me and myself, I'm not doing enough. So... Um, because you have a vision of yourself at exactly. a higher level. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, but no, I have to like, so that feeling is like, I would get a little period of just like closing up a little bit, but then I would just like set up another goal or like working towards either like the higher goal or setting up a new like challenge or a new goal and then working towards it. So like putting goals for myself and like putting challenges makes me keep going. Interesting. Yeah. I guess it's about finding out what works for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I learned from disappointments. Like, like I can get disappointed in myself because I did something wrong. That, like, for example, I did like I competed, I won. Let's say it's it's a triathlon competition. I won the event, but I know that I did things wrong. So I'm disappointed in myself, but I won anyway. So I will take the win. I will be happy with the win. But then I'm disappointed on the mistakes that I made that I shouldn't have made. 
So the next competition, I'm gonna, I mean, the next, like, when I get back to training, I'm going to try to work harder on those things that I did wrong. Sure. And then the next competition, I'm going to improve. So It's just sometimes, I guess, when I was using my own example, the disappointment feels crushing and you want to dwell on it. It took me three years to get over a relationship. Yeah. That's dwelling on it. Yeah, because you want to, too. Like, I mean, yeah, you Amen. just allow yourself to do that. Yes. Yeah. And it's the easy way. We're human. So we try to find the easy way of doing Swim things. in your own misery for some time. Because it's comfortable. Mm. And people are feeling bad for you. And people are just like being nice to you. Oh, I'm an introvert. I was just being <laughs> this, is, this was all just me by myself. So but I was loving yeah. it. I was like, oh, swim in my own misery. <laughs> so, so yeah. But because it is the easy way. And the hard way is just like you just say, come on. It's over. You can't do anything. Like what I say, you can't do anything about the past, mm. but you can change the future. So why would you cry over that if you can change what will happen later? Mm. So because if you keep that mood, you're just your life is gonna be the same as what just happened. Sure. And you're not gonna change. It's not gonna change either way. Well, like, nothing changes yeah. all the time. Exactly. And it's not like that's not gonna change. Like you cannot do anything about what happened before. So why would you cry over it? Mm. Like, yes, it is bad. It's well, do you're crying, yeah. but just don't, don't live in it. <laughs> exactly. Like, don't dwell on yeah. it for like yeah. three years. I mean, crying, you cry just one night and then that's it. <laughs> okay. I mean, maybe, maybe a bit more than one night. <laughs> What's been the best piece of advice you've received? Hmm. Um, I think take your time and don't rush things because sometimes I tend to be like I tend to want things right here right now we all do <laughs> so, give me the six pack now <laughs> so uh, so yeah I think and I always try to remind myself of that like especially if sometimes I'm very hard on myself it's like yeah, I started triathlon a year ago, now I want to do this, you know, like I want to be here and I want to be here. No, like it doesn't happen overnight, like I have to give myself some time. So, and sometimes I tend to not give myself enough time. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, I think, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I, like, I keep reminding myself of, is that like taking my time doing things. Mm. So. What's been the best piece of advice you received mm -hmm. and didn't follow? And it was a mistake not to follow? Mm, don't trust. Don't trust. Don't trust. I think. I mean. You were told not to trust. Not not to trust, but I tend to trust everyone. Like I'm. I don't know how to explain that, but um, I trust people just because. It's a nice. Thing. I see no, but I see the good in people. Like I don't see evil in people, and I always like get stabbed in the back or like screwed or because of that trust. Mm -hmm. So it's like. How to say it? like I like the people that are close to me tell me to just like um, not I really don't know how to phrase you can that. say it in French no <laughs> it's it's hard to phrase because um, um, I need to like it's really about trust it's about trusting people and just like giving people my trust uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. So, because for me, I say like what I say to myself is like, why would this people, what this this person hurt me? Sure. So for me, I I'm like I didn't do anything bad to this person. Sure. Why would they hurt me? But I mean, uh, people are not like that. that exactly, people are not like that. So um, so yeah, I always get this like my mom reminds me all the time that or like you need to be a bit more wary. Exactly. You trust. Yeah. Yeah. What's been the worst piece of advice you've been given? Stop sports. <laughs> Why are you doing this to yourself? <laughs> Why are you torturing yourself? Get a life. Yeah. This is my life. But exactly, and this is from the closest people to me, like from my family. Like, I I remember my mom uh, when I told her, like in 2014, I stopped swimming. Uh, to end of 2013, no, end of two, no, end of 2014, I stopped swimming. I stopped swimming because I was fed up with everything and I was not enjoying swimming anymore. So, and I stopped for like six months. The day I told my mom that I'm going back to swim, she cried. 
What did she say? She cried and she was like, why are you doing this to us? So, but back back story like not again behind the scenes yeah. exactly because my parents suffered a lot from me doing the sports because back home like in Tunisia it's either you have to have connections or you don't get anything done mm-hmm. so so my parents like I was in France or in the US and they were taking care of everything back home mm-hmm. so they needed to go meet with the ministry to get me like my uh, my scholarship money they needed to go do this to go do that like my dad used to stay in the ministry for for a whole day to be able to meet with the person in charge like at the end of the day and sometimes they don't accept him sometimes they just tell him to come back the next day so it's like they went through a lot for me yes so when i told them i was stopping they told me are you sure about that and then i told them yes and, and then and my mom was like, okay, it's your decision. But when I told her that I'm going back, she was like, no, not this again. Like, but I knew, but, and because of this, I knew that I needed to take things on my own hands and not make them go through whatever they went through again. So I was just like, like doing it myself. Yes. So I was spending my money on whatever I wanted to do. And so they just not go through whatever they went through. But, um, but yeah, that's one thing. But now my mom is so, like, she's happy for me. Like, whatever, that's why I told you, like, they're very supportive yes. of whatever, like, decision I take. So, um, but sometimes it's, like, it's beyond them. It's, like, it's too strong that they cannot just, like, hide it. And in all fairness, if we were to look at it, you're in the fortunate basket. Yeah. Where you still had supportive parents. Exactly. Um, there yeah. are times, I mean, in most cases, parents want the best for you. Yeah. But they're limited with what they know, with mm-hmm. what they have, with yeah. the resources. Yeah, and I see some some people, and they keep blaming their parents for where they are. I'm like, yeah. why are you blaming your parents? Yeah. Sure, let's say they've done wrong. Exactly. But that was their best capability with what they had, and that you time. Can, you can't parents. blame your parents for anything because they always will try to do whatever they can. Yes, be grateful. To get you. Exactly. So it's it's not. I mean, did my parents do everything right? No, but I'm not blaming them for anything, and it's just like it's how it is and I wouldn't change it for anything in the world like whatever they did for me I'm so grateful and I'll be grateful for my whole life sure. so uh, but, that, but this is like even my close family like not my parents my parents are very supportive like since I got back and since like every time I like do something they're very supportive and they're like they just like try to help me with whatever they can but like my close family they'll be like why are you doing this well and this is the new thing is that you need to get married. You need to find a husband. <laughs> you need to do this. Yeah. Time's yes. coming up. Believe me, these are my aunts. So, um, yeah, and they're playing that card. I'm a guy like, and I get that. So, so I'm like, it's I like, don't have yeah. this. Like, why are you pointing this to me? <laughs> so now it's that. It's like, and so they'll be like, oh, because you're doing sports and you cannot like focus on your social life. You cannot focus on your relationship life and you cannot this. And you can, I'm like, this is my life. If a guy is going to take me, he needs to take the, the full package. It's not like I'm not going to be separated from my four. You hear that? <laughs> it's just the reality of it. You know, but the worst advice can just come from a lot of places. Yeah. But very often I've noticed with many individuals who I've spoken with mm-hmm. and over the years, it comes from the people that are actually They're closest closer, to them. Yeah. Not because they want bad for you. No. It's just what they know. Exactly. And the truth is, no one knows you and what you want to achieve and your goal yeah. and your, that inner desire more than yourself. True. I ask this question often, but I'm going to ask of you because it really makes sense since you do so much. Mm-hmm. How do you get yourself in the zone? Oh. Do you listen to kind of, are there certain tracks that you listen to in terms of music to get in the zone? Do you have a vision board? Mm. Is it a conversation you have with, with a, like a beast friend that puts you in the zone? What is it? Because we all have that days. You know, yeah. I, I joke with my audience and I say, when I wake up every day, it's a bad day. Mm-hmm. I'll either dwell okay, on it and yeah. nothing happens, or yeah. I've learned from winners yeah. that you choose the state. Yeah. Like you have to make that active decision. And generally speaking, don't speak to me before coffee. <laughs> so what gets me in a good state is a double espresso. Okay. Uh, what well, is it for how, you? Is how, what is it? Is um, it a drink? Is it food? Is it music? Is it smell? For some people, it's smell. No, actually, it, it's is really... It naturally high? <laughs> naturally high, yes. <laughs> no, well, it's, it's the coffee in the morning. That's for sure. 
Uh, I need to get my coffee. But I'm not addicted to coffee in a way that, like, if I don't get my coffee, I'm gonna be in a bad mood. No. Um, but no, I, 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 if I have a good night of sleep, I'm, I'm perfect the next day. Okay. I think it's like resting the night before. Yes. Like, as I told you, like, for example, in the morning, if I don't sleep enough, I'm just gonna have that couple of like seconds feeling like, oh, I don't wanna go to training today, I don't wanna do it, but then I just like get myself back into it. But if I have a good night of sleep, I will wake up before my alarm, so. When you're training, are you list what are you listening to? Are you listening to anything? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I, uh, when I run and when I cycle, I do listen to music. So I have a favorite playlist, yeah, okay. uh, that I listen to, What's which that is one song that always puts you in a uh, champion of Carrie Underwood. That's my favorite song for now. Like I used to have favorite songs, but every time like it there's yeah, exactly. So before it was "What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger," okay. because I love that song, and it's actually it's one of my best songs ever uh, because I I relate to whatever she's saying, but now it's the champion, and I also relate to whatever Terry Andrew really sing. So I love that song. And when I put it in the car, I just like start singing out loud with it. And yeah, I have a thing for like singing in my car. So that thing gets me in the mood. Like even if in a, I'm in a bad mood and I get into my car and I put the music on, I put it loud and I start like singing and dancing with it. And I go crazy in my car. So people like will be like looking at me on the side. Thank God I have like a little bit tinted windows. So I put them up and people don't see me, but I still can't see. Professional seat dancing. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, that's what makes me happy. Like, that's what gets me just like in the, in the mood. Parents aside, because obviously they've, they've had a significant role in your life. Mm -hmm. Who would you say were the, were the people that influenced you the most? Say when you were in Florida, mm -hmm. when you were in France, here in Dubai. If you had to perhaps pick maybe one in either each stage of your life or one from, you know, every kind of setting, who were the people that whose shoulder you leaned on, one way or another, whether it was advice they've given you, yeah. opportunity they opened up for you, um, however it was that, that helped you in terms of tipping points in your life. Yeah, that's that's a very good question actually. Um, well, it, it was, so when I was in France, it was my coach, uh, Joanne Le Bion, for, for the second part, like 2006, 2008, um, we were very close and he was like, he knew how to take me and how to get me to do my best mm -hmm. and to like be the best. Um, when I moved to Florida, it was my advisor, Tim I, uh, our academic advisor, so swimming and diving academic advisor, um, and my coach, Anthony Nesti. Do you ask so, for help? I don't. You need it? No, I don't. You're that's, that's one thing about me that I don't ask for help. Like, I remember in 2013, uh, when I uh, left the first club that I was working for and uh, 2014 like uh, June 2014 I was sleeping in my car because I didn't want to ask anyone to like help me out so uh, I might I mean it was like two nights or like one night but still it was not because I was like getting a job with a federation and it was like in the process and things and I was moving apartments so I left my stuff with my friend and then like my friend left, so he left me in his apartment. But when he was there, I was like, I'm not, I'm not getting into the apartment. I don't want your help. I don't need anybody's help. So it's, I don't know if it's like a trait or like a bad thing about me, but I don't ask for help. I don't like asking for help. It's, it's really, it has to be like a matter of life or death to be like, to go and ask someone for help. Somehow I feel you still won't ask for help. <laughs> I'm gonna handle this on my own. <laughs> exactly, and that's what I do. So, <laughs> your future son or daughter, if you could only teach them one trait, mm -hmm. one habit, or one skill, or one thought to help them the most in their life, to be the best that they could be, what would that one thing be? One thing. Yes. And one thing only. Yes. Oh God. <laughs> I'll give you an example. When yeah. I look back. And the many mistakes I've made, mm -hmm. uh, I study successful people, I speak about them, mm -hmm. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I'm blessed that my younger brother has got two beautiful sons. Aww. And for me, since he's had the kids, uh -huh. they don't really know this unless I've, I've shared it or if they've heard me you know, say it somewhere else, it, it changed something in me where I wanted to be a great uncle for them that they could be proud of me. Okay. And so a lot of my thoughts have become Oh, if I could teach Kareem or if I could teach Hakim one thing, mm -hmm. if they listen. <laughs> when you grow up, you better listen. 
uh, what would it be? Okay, so and what I'm would thinking, it be? in my case, I've learned that talent aside, hopefully his parents will work on the ethics of hard work, mm -hmm. but if I could be teaching them just one thing, it would be discipline. Okay. Because if you have the discipline to do something day in, day out, yeah. it doesn't matter if you're average. That day in, day out, and yeah. whatever you do, mm -hmm. will make you damn great yeah. at whatever it is you choose to do, that you will stand out. Yeah. And I just feel like if that could be my gift to them, that would be it. Okay, for me... That's how that question Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, for me, it would be like, never let anyone tell you that you cannot do something. Uh, because... I will tell them like if you set your goal, don't let anybody discourage you. Like that's 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 I think that's a very valuable advice that a lot of because I see it around me and I see it in like in my everyday life that sometimes people they would have like really great plans and big things to big like big dreams and big dreams and then someone just comes and Exactly, yeah. and they just like decide not to do it because X, Y, or Z said no, you cannot do it. So I would tell them that don't would be let. A powerful them. Attitude. Yeah. So I, I would because I'm like that. Like I don't let those noises just like they're noises. They're nothing more, nothing less. They're just noises aside, and they actually, if they're gonna do something, they make me even stronger and even more willing to do what I want to do. So, um, oh, so I yeah. Sense that. yeah. So that would yeah. be great attitude. Yeah, so that would be the advice is like, don't let anybody tell you that you cannot do something. 500 years from now. Oh God. <laughs> not sure if social media is gonna exist or not. I hope not. <laughs> your great, great, great grandkids are gonna open up, I don't even know if it's gonna be a book, but they'll open something up. <laughs> but yeah, like Minority Report. On the screen, 500 years from now, it's gonna read, Sarah Lajnaf, was a fighter. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. That's that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. I got this one. Thank you. Yeah. Because yeah. you feel it. It's not just yeah, words. Yeah. You actually feel it. Oh, yeah. that's that's super. Hey, this is the part where, if there is anything from the viewers, if you have an ask or from the listeners, um, I know you said you're not very much active on social media, but if they would like to follow you on social okay. media. Mm -hmm. um, I do which, have social media. I know you do. Yeah. But which one are you active in? Uh, Instagram. Let's say sponsors are want to come rushing through and you should. <laughs> Instagram. Instagram is the best way to reach yes. you. Uh, what is it? It is Sarah Lagnaf official. So, and we'll put yeah. the links anyway. So if you don't know the yeah. spelling, you'll see it in the links uh, yeah. below. Do you have an ask of the audience? Um, is there something you'd like them to do? Is there something you'd like them you like them to follow your work? Check yeah, out your website. I mean, uh, no, but like first, like an advice to everyone. Mm -hmm. Like I said, that don't let anybody let you that you cannot do something. And um, being a female athlete or a female in general is a privilege and it's an advantage. So use it in your advantage. Don't feel like you're enter privileged just because you're a female athlete or just because you're a woman um, because we can do great things and um, yeah we can show the world that we actually can do things that men cannot do oh so, you are you yeah. are showing it. <laughs> you've showed this man what he can do <laughs> you're definitely doing it um, folks i don't know about you but i can tell you this that i have got so much i got so much from just doing the intro uh, like i said i felt like an underachiever not by means of hate, not by means of jealousy. I'm truly inspired by this young lady. And this conversation has just taken that inspiration to the next level. Uh, watch this video again or listen to this podcast again because I will be reviewing it. And like always, the second time around, you're going to get even more gems than the first time. The intention of this show is not to show off. The intention of this show is to help you get inspired, get informed and get going. And I truly believe that was such a lovely person, beauty, brains, beast. She's not just words. She's really showing it on a day-to-day -day basis. She doesn't want to be defined by anything. She's constantly choosing uh, to consciously make and redefine her life and what she's doing. Um, you can really see just the way, and the way she's thinking is so simple. Um, I hope you got gems out of it because I got gems out of it. <laughs> truly, I, I really, truly do. Um, if you've got questions, please ask them. You can ask your questions below the video or wherever you like. 
I'll try and answer them. I'll try to get Sarah to answer them. If we can't, I'll get another guest to share and answer your questions from their perspective on things. Speaking of guests, who else would you like to see on this show? Um, we'll put out an invitation and ask them to come through. Who do you recommend we bring on the show um, that could add value to our audience? Oh God, that's a, that's a good question. Do you bring people from the region or people all from... Walks of life. All walks of life. Oh. Uh, we try to do it in Dubai, considering the podcast is live from Dubai. Yeah. That's a question to answer later on. All right. Let me think about it. <laughs> all right, we've got to get her referrals a bit later on. Um, folks, I hope you had a good, enjoyed the show. I hope you got gems out of it. Please, if you just get one thought out of what Sarah has shared, and she's shared plenty, put it into action. Just take one thing and put it into action, because I don't know if you've got this. I really hope you do. Otherwise, why are you listening or watching this? She's a lady of action. Uh, and it doesn't and if you look at the way she's shared her thoughts it's simple it's the simplicity of the way she thinks that has helped her get to where she is and if she can do it i feel like i can do it and i hope that if you like you can do whatever it is you want to do whether it's sports business charity work whatever it is make the most with what you have or how did you say it in Avec French? Les du bord. one more time Avec les du bord. oh just like that <laughs> that sounds so good so wonderful Thank, thank you, you so Jeff. much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Thank you for this invitation, and it was a pleasure. We it had, was, it we was had really some good fun. laughs, even really though really her fun. laughs were at me, but that's okay because we had to do a few takes. <laughs> it was really fun. It was but really you, nice. you've got a cool laugh, and thank I hope you. we get to do parts two and three. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Tune in. <laughs> um, folks, I hope you got inspired, I hope you got informed, and I hope you get going. My name is Kevin Abdurrahman. This is How Do They Do It.